right, guys. Hello, everyone. Seems like you already have started. So let's just wait uh, two, three minutes more for people to gather a bit and we'll kick off. Better a bit late than never. So I think we can afford waiting a couple of minutes more. Meanwhile, in uh, Slido, if you can uh, give some feedback about the quality of the sound of the picture, if you see something, if you're able to log in, so please, or in Slack, or in Slido, please uh, let us know if uh, at least something is working. Good morning. I just started answering in Slido. Okay, okay, so if everything runs perfectly, then just can wait maybe one minute more and we can start. How is the mood, guys? How are the other courses that you're visiting? What you found uh, interesting in the summer school? Because I am sure that some of the topics that you most probably already have uh, seen in this course will be a good, so to say, follow up after this course. I mean that. Uh, in this two days, we'll learn a bit more about financial data structure, how to deal with them. And after you might want to run with some advanced techniques, maybe like probabilistic programming, causal learning, etc., etc. So if you took these courses, I think it will be a great follow up for you. Okay, I think uh, I'm checking YouTube. It's 73 people watching now. So I think we can slowly, but, but uh, strongly kick off. All right, basically, hello again, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Honcher, and uh, in these two days, we're gonna talk and learn about financial data structures. And the bottom line of this uh, set of lectures will be showing you why financial machine learning or machine learning in finance is very, very, very different from industrial data practices, as computer vision, NLP, or working as the tabular data is nothing like Kaggle competitions where to get the best accuracy, you have your, you know, set up a number of techniques. And also is really nothing like research papers you used to read and implement. So basically, if uh, you are probably not going to work with financial data in the future, at least for you, it will be some sort of a paradigm shift where you'll see that there is something different than just making convolutional neural networks or finding birds. And if you are going to work with financial data for you, it might be a sign of that maybe convolutional networks and birds is something that you are not going to work with. Uh, before we start, a couple words about me. Basically, I think today I can call myself with these uh, three words. I'm the entrepreneur, practitioner, and educator. And as the first one, I am co-founder and chief officer at Neurons Lab. It's a consulting boutique. And basically, my job is being responsible for creating, selling, and developing AI solutions worldwide. Obviously, I'm also a practitioner. And the last seven years, I'm just dealing with the building data-driven products. And uh, some of these products are actually financial products. And you can talk about it a bit later. And also, I'm a participant in the data science contest, Numerai. And I'm in the top 10% of the participants there and again 
later we'll discuss numerai as well. But for example, if you want to be in top 10% on Kaggle, you really want to have the best architectures, the best birds, the best convolution neural networks, the best data augmentation, the best external data sources, etc., 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 etc. But actually, at numerai, I'm in top percent just as a linear model. And this is also an interesting point about financial data. That it's not the model that's going to make you good. It's the understanding of the finance. And also I'm an educator. Basically, I'm here as a part of my, let's say, educational activities. I write a Medium blog with more than 1 million views. I was writing some scientific articles and I was teaching courses at the University of Verona, here at Ukrainian Catholic University, at Kiev Polytechnic University some years ago. And also I'm giving like, speeches across the conferences in Europe. And uh, now a couple of words about you guys. Uh, what you're working on, uh, are you students, professionals, entrepreneurs, analysts? Are you working or not working with financial data? And what are your goals? What do you want to get? Because basically I'm pretty flexible and uh, yeah, have some things prepared, but uh, we can actually change, thing, change things on the fly. So now I'll stop the presentation for a couple of minutes because I would like to know what you guys are working on. Uh, what is your focus and, uh, yep. Uh, I'm just also will read aloud some things from the slide on, so you're all aligned. Uh, found very interesting graph neural networks, uh, but so far too much theory and uh, practical stuff is tensorflow key respect torch. Yeah, graph neural networks is really interesting stuff. I, am, I also actually know just theory about them, but it uh, but it's, looks interesting. Question, how to be good at understanding financial data? That's the focus and basically understanding financial data in practice, I mean, with code, that's what we'll be gonna have both days. So this is what you guys will get. Maybe a bit more, because I see you guys are 87 people now. I'm sure you guys have something to tell. Or to ask, or to complain already, for example, why you started 10 minutes late? Need job experience in financial ML. I have experience in NLP and neural networks. Ooh, job experience in financial ML is the hard one because actually to enter the financial field, you kind of need to be working in a financial institution, but we're going to talk about this as well, about job experience. Uh, I work for improvement of public procurement in Ukraine. I want to improve Prozoro system. There's a lot of financial data here. I want to try to write a profile, corrupt tenders and Prozoro. That's... That's what I think you have some really important insights for this, yes. Uh, studying statistics, Tarashevchink University, last year was working as inflation data using time series. Yes, we're gonna talk about it a lot. Uh, data analyst with background economics, freshman data science, it will be perfect for you. Credit model, model validation, you're gonna learn interesting things. Don't work with financial data, like with medicine, neuroscience. Uh, at least uh, I am sure that some tricks from finance will be really, really, you can relate to this medicine because in finance, we can uh, really stack the wealth and capital of uh, wealthy people in order to get something. And in medicine, you, for example, in finance, the capital is at stake, in medicine, the human life and health is at stake. So both fields, in both fields, you really need to be careful so there are some tricks that you can exchange from back and forth. Uh, financial data in Excel, beginner ML data science, pretty easy to learn new approaches. Yes, that's good. Uh, cognitive modeling, skills can apply ML for financial analysis, perfect. Instability in financial markets from an ergodic theory point of view. Wow, that's interesting. I think you also will get useful things from this course. I like, I like as your background, I think most of the things I prepared are already like a perfect fit. Uh, I would like to know common models for analyzing financial data. Yes, 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 yes. Practical knowledge. Most of the things guys will be practical. Assistant professor in the UK working energy efficiency, data monitoring, interesting financial time series data and predictions, as I can trust 
Yes, definitely. I think uh, the background we're going to study this today is you definitely will be able to transfer for the energy markets as well. Uh, overall structure, yes, we're going to talk about overall structures. Okay, perfect. I think we are really well aligned. So we can go, go further. Uh, what I, I just want to give a note what we are not going to discuss just, just to be clear a Technical analysis the things that you may be reading internet about some golden ratios patterns fractals and similar things uh, From my opinion, this is something what is amateurish and uh, We can discuss it uh, Some other time, but I think for now, let's leave it uh, for people who don't have, let's say, more structured education in finance and financial mathematics. Also, we are not going to talk about the fundamental analysis, about reading reports and some ratios, analysis, the more classical analysis. Basically, this is where machine learning can be applied. We're going to talk about it a little bit, but we are not going to do practical things about it. We also will relatively, I would say, skip a bit the complex financial mathematics, some advanced probabilities, the Hasek process theory, but uh, at least some background we will cover in this course. And deep learning for price prediction is definitely not for this. Not, that's not what we're going to talk about. The first day, what we're going to uh, talk about today. Basically, I want to give for people who don't have a financial background, I want to show a bit more like about what these algorithmic investments are about, the structure point of view. So, Guys, for example, who are data scientists without economical or financial education, that's the background. We all need to be on the same page. Then we're going to review financial data structures from a retail side of the finance to analysis of the alternative data. Then the most important is criteria of success. How do we actually measure that our models are doing something useful? And then we're going to have two relatively big, both theoretical and practical sessions. We're going to perform some classical analysis classical approaches to algorithmic investments, and then more like machine learning like approaches to algorithmic investments. And we're gonna review the algorithms and apply them to the data sets. So this is, I think, will be the most interesting part. And you see, I say that day one is kind of like about the safe path to save money for retirement days, because I really want to start from classical approaches where you use the mathematical models to kind of learn about the market but not speculate on the market. So I think I want to start, how do we, from big universe of the assets and the properties, how do we build a good investment portfolio that will at least uh, keep us safe. And tomorrow, uh, we're gonna do a bit more on the speculations. So basically, we're gonna go to zero of the active investment management. We are going to research, study what is the alpha, what is the alpha research, we're gonna actually dive about financial machine learning for predictions. You see why it's different from convolutional networks and birds and in other fields you already know. Uh, then we're gonna try to do the pipeline, let's say I call it in a Kaggle way. Basically we do everything correct uh, to predict the asset prices. That's what people do in the academical articles. Actually, I'll tell you more. I was the one who wrote a couple of articles who are completely wrong uh, from the asset prediction, but they, are, Basically, that's what kind of everyone does today. And we're gonna review why this struggle is completely wrong. Then we will fix, fix mainly inputs and outputs with respect to the financial logic. And you'll see that even linear models can perform really well if you make the data right. And actually that's why course is called financial data structures because we really are not really going to work with the algorithms because algorithms don't matter here. And uh, then we're gonna do the right pipeline about prediction of the asset prices. And also tomorrow I hope you'll have some time. So really we want, I want to talk a bit more about the research things. Why this quantity of research is filled with the theoretical physicists uh, and the basically what is this job about more from the research point of view. All right, uh, I hope this is uh, a bit clear, we are aligned. I'll just go to the slide for one more second just to check. Uh, some things. Basically, nothing, nothing very, very new. Thanks, guys, for your answers. Uh, I think we are really good to go ahead. So first, rolls and goes. What people in finance are actually doing? 
let's start with this. Uh, for most of us, the figures in finance, this like the figures from the movies, series, or the popular figures in the real world. So we, uh, if you, I think most of you watch the Wolf of Wall Street. I think some of you watch the Billion series, and this is about some like uh, guys who are kind of into trick other participants of the market, as in case of Bobby Axelrod with the insider trading, in case of Jordan Belfort uh, trading some let's say not very really valuable assets. Uh, and if you read the news about finance, about investments, I'm sure you know about Warren Buffett and his famous value-driven investing. I think you also know about the Ray Dalio, about his uh, kind of like your cycle theory. Basically, this is the figures uh, that you see in public. But what normal guys like us do in this uh, world? This slide, it has a relatively old, it's a, a style basically maybe 10 years old. So basically you can see like C++, Java, MATLAB. So, and the numbers are maybe not that relevant for today. But uh, when we want to talk about uh, finance and what people do there, first we need to separate front office, back office, and buy side and sell side. So basically what is more interesting for most of us, that's what these guys in a way do. It sounds like a front office buy side. So front office is the people who are basically, as you can imagine, the front line. And the buy side is actually when you buy things, that buy some assets or buy some instruments that will grow the value with time. So basically this is the about investment. This is about the trading. This is what uh, sounds like the sexiest job in a way. Uh, a part of buying the assets in the front office, and this is, for example, what you can do in the hedge fund or the investment fund. But also, for example, there are the banks that are actually creating and selling these instruments. There are people who create uh, different options, the people who create different indices, different uh, funds, and they actually sell in their financial products so other people and other participants of the market can buy them. For example, they can be a financial institution, can be a bank, it can be just a group of people who know finance, and they create the investment product. Basically, they uh, gather the most interesting AI companies. For instance, they make their own portfolio of these AI companies, and I can show you guys that this portfolio is growing or something. And you guys can invest in my portfolio and grow with me. And this is the investment product. And uh, people from this side, they're also in the front, they want to sell their products. And for example, us, as prop traders, or maybe some in other banks, other investment funds can buy these products. And also there is, of course, there is back office. And if you're talking about the investments uh, and some quantitative asset management, there should be people who are doing the data scrapping, who are using the infrastructure, execution, administration. And this is basically data engineering in the back office. Uh, if you're talking about the buy set of the investments. And if you're talking about the banks or companies who create the financial products, back office is mainly doing some risk management. Uh, they're doing like technology like website, mobile apps, operations, etc., etc., etc. This is what may sound as the most normal job ever. It's like basically making a mobile app for a bank is like something like back office sell side. And uh, yeah, this is what are the general roles. If we talk about the applied directions of the some sort of mathematical modeling, machine learning or AI, uh, basically in the banking, there are retail operations. Basically, when you want to sell your product, when you want to sell some services of the bank, there are always the user's data. So basically you need to do some machine learning, maybe to segment the customers, maybe to predict the churn, to predict some anomalies. There are also P2P operations. Basically, when I am in a, I'm the client of several banks, I'm doing the transactions, and maybe I'm doing some fraudulent transactions. So analyzing the anomalies of fraudulent transactions, this is analysis of the P2P operations. And also there is, of course, lending and credit scoring. So basically also this is what happens in the banks. There is asset management. Uh, basically, this is the long-term, I mean, if you're talking more casually, long-term investments. Well, first of all, you want to do some representation learning. So from all the data from the market, you want to understand the structure. Maybe you want to understand the market driving factors. And this is, you want to learn there's some more low dimension kind of clear representation of the market. So based on this, you can do your decisions. Then when you, let's say, understand the market quantitatively, you want to do some portfolio optimization. So basically, 
uh, portfolio optimization, that's what the main focus of today. So I'm not gonna stop about it now. And then also risk management. Uh, you want to allocate your assets, you want to manage your assets with respect to some risks. You want to evaluate this risk correctly. You want to maybe forecast this risk correctly. This is also about the asset management. And then there's also active trading, basically when you don't just invest and kind of wait or for some months or for some years, basically you may speculate, you may forecast things intraday and even inside the day, inside a couple of minutes, you want to do some uh, operations that make you a lot, relatively small, but profits. So this is, for example, the, you want to forecast the price intraday so you know where is the ups, where is the downs, and where to buy and where to sell. Also, there is optimal execution part. So basically, okay, you can forecast that in half an hour something's gonna happen, but uh, okay, this is your half an hour window where you know that something's gonna happen, but when exactly you want to execute? Uh, what bet you need to make? This is the question of the optimal execution. And then you need to turn these forecasts and your some execution policy into actually the whole strategy. This is another direction that you might work on. And if uh, we talk about the asset management and trading, because this is something what uh, will be a bit more focused of these lectures, uh, the dream team is kind of big. And also we need to see the whole, st whole structure so we understand what people are actually doing. It all starts with the analysts who are actually researching the ideas and uh, imagine the crypto market. The guys who are really follow in the field and they can say, look guys, at some particular stage of the market, when the new alternative coins are releasing, they can say, what is really driving the market is the discussions in the Telegram chats. So their, their coins are being pumped. So if you analyze the data from the chats, we can predict the pumps and basically we can earn some money. They're basically given the idea in a nutshell. And then the data curators, basically data engineers, their job is to collect the raw data from the Telegrams. Uh, okay, just imagine they got it, and then they're feature analysts. Basically, they're also they can be machine learning engineers, they can be uh, mathematicians, applied mathematicians who take these Telegram conversations and turn them into the features. For example, they can using some NLP techniques, they can ex uh, extract sentiment, they can extract keywords, they can extract the amount of messages per day regarding some coin. So they build the features that by opinion of the analyst, they correlate with the future price movements. Then there are the strategists who are trying to turn these features and the market data, they're trying to actually exploit these correlations and these relationships to build a strategy. Then there are back testers who basically their job is to break the strategy. They're trying some simulations. They're running the historical data. They're simulating some stress situations. Basically, they're trying to evaluate the strategy from a different point of view. They can say, okay, if we run the strategy on the historical data of the last two years, yeah, it can work pretty well. But then they run some simulations. For example, they say, imagine that no one writing this Telegram chat anymore and wow, the strategy breaks. Or just imagine that something happens with the exchange where we're actually going to execute the trades. Bam, it breaks. So backtesters, they're also working closely with the analysts and data creators to evaluate all possible risks. There's also deployment team, basically they're the engineers who are making the ecosystem, making the infrastructure and connect everything from the data collection to the execution. So the algorithm can actually run in real time and make some money. And later on, there's also portfolio managers who oversee the set of the strategies because normally you want to have not a single idea, you want to have hundreds of ideas. And uh, portfolio managers, they're cherry picking the best strategies, making the portfolio of the strategies, and that's how they work. And basically I have been through all this process because we, are, we were building this the team the product basically it was the investment product in the crypto market so basically what i'm telling you it's like the real story that's how it was happening uh, if uh, let's answer some questions a bit though uh, let's discuss if everything's clear or not clear maybe already have some questions regarding the roles uh, i'm i'm ready to answer do you have a portfolio made with machine learning algorithms? I have had a portfolio made with machine learning algorithms. Currently, this, uh, this portfolio is inactive.
let's just discuss a couple of minutes what we're talking about. Or if you have no questions, if everything is really clear, just write the plus or just say it's clear, okay, so we can move forward and don't waste the time. What's been the most interesting role you've been a part of uh, and why? I mean, uh, to me, I, I'm basically because of my background, I can be only, I think, in two roles. I can be in a role of uh, feature analysis and strategies because I'm a plan mathematician by the background, by education. So basically, that's what I can do. And uh, I think I can be like some sort of a manager of this because of. Uh, also because of my background, but for example, I don't have a really strong uh, financial education, for example. So basically I need a partner who is the financial analyst who can explain the financial idea. And uh, basically based on this, I, as a mathematician, I can already extract the features and build the strategies, something like this. But basically uh, you, need the team of all those people. So yeah, I can be in a green zone, but without the data engineers, I will not gonna, I'm not gonna have a data. Without analysts, I even do not know what to work with. Without the deployment team, my strategy will never be trading. And uh, okay, maybe I also can be the portfolio manager from the quantitative point of view, yes. Oh, Igor, everything's clear so far. Hello, Igor. <laughs> then uh, we can move forward. Is everything clear so far? All right. I also want to show a couple of links uh, of the researcher and practitioner who I think is the, from my humble opinion, is the one of the, let's say, strongest, strongest, strongest practitioners in the market. And uh, Marcus Lopez de Prado, people who are a bit interested in the field, they know a bit about him. And basically, I really I want to show a couple of points from his slides because he's explaining some things uh, much better than me. <laughs> and uh, basically, first I want to show ten applications apart from the slide I showed you before. As you can see, what can machine learning do for us? First of all, it's price predictions. And uh, why machine learning? Because it, uh, as you can see, it can model many different. Uh, complicated relations between the features. So you can see nonlinear and threshold, hierarchical relations, you can treat with the mix of the categorical and the continuous variables, and the econometric models that uh, people who study economics or finance, they learn to universities. Basically, they just mostly have some linear or exponential relationships, but nothing more. Also, there is the concept called uh, hedging. Basically, we have a portfolio that has some risks. We might want to have some part of portfolio that is hedging our risks. So basically, uh, some counterpart, some portfolio that if something happens, you'll be able to cover our losses with some another, um, another financial instrument. This is what we are not going to discuss in depth. But basically, machine learning can also be applied basically to 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 work with the to work with the hedging portfolio construction. This is what we're going to work uh, today with. So basically, when we have uh, the huge market, you can have the hundreds and thousands of different assets. For example, you want to do some primitive analysis and sort of correlations, but uh, correlations or covariance matrices. And as you can see. Uh, covariance matrix it uh, basically it's huge and uh, you might easily fall in the trap of the curse of dimensionality because the more dimensions your data structure has this the more complex to work with the more uh, chance that you overfit with etc 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 but uh, if you impose some more interesting structure for example hierarchical structure into your assets you reduce your dimensionality drastically and it allows you more interesting, more smart analysis of your portfolio. This is what we're going to do today, for example. Uh, detection of the outliers. Uh, so basically, instead of relying on some fixed model with fixed parameters to find the outliers, you can rely on machine learning models that are usually better than this. And uh, I think if you want, we can discuss outliers a bit more using generative models, for example, or autoencoders. 
Also, bet sizing. So basically, if you can predict the price with something, of course, you can also, apart from predicting the price, you want to predict how much you want to bet on this uh, forecast. And basically, it's really straightforward. If you have some model, it usually gives you some probability from zero to one. And uh, what you can do, for example, if your model gives something about 0 0.5, so basically your model is very uncertain, you maybe even want to skip this bet because uh, why you want to even bet on something which is very uncertain. If the model says uh, 0 0.75, it kind of says yes, but it knows my 100% is sure it's yes. So you might decrease your bet a bit. Feature importance. So basically, this is the, also the field that we're going to focus a bit more tomorrow on. But uh, for you guys who study, again, finance, econometrics, uh, you learn a lot of different formulas. Uh, and uh, what's the good point about these formulas? Uh, that uh, you can easily say that these parameters A, B, C, D, E, and you can analyze their importance. So basically, everything is clear. And uh, that's why people may say, oh, machine learning is a black box, I'll not be able to understand anything, blah, blah, blah. But when you actually analyze feature importance, you can build uh, something what is very complex and reverse engineer these complex models to get the same explanation of what your model does. Also, as you can see, I can uh, do the ranking on the credits. It can do some recommendations. It also can work with the unstructured data very well. Uh, because basically also why in uh, finance you work with formulas, because formulas, they're like super structured easy data. And on structured data, it can be like news articles, it can be satellite images and something else. Uh, again, execution also can be useful for, and detection of the false investment strategies. That's what you also will check a bit more today, how classical formulas, really they are not taking into account a lot of different sources of the risks. And uh, later we'll also read different uh, materials. I also, you have all the risk for, links for all these materials. Uh, links all will be on Slack, yes. You can know this question so it doesn't stack up. Oh yeah, I definitely have to do it. I just, I just don't know how to do it, okay. Is Marcos Lopez de Prada a serious scientist? I heard about him and there, but always has doubts. Well, uh, from the empirical finance, as actually we will see that uh, his approaches are, are simply working and approaches of, let's say, classical machine learning are not working with finance. So it uh, depends what you call a serious scientist. If for you serious scientist is the inventor of the new series in physics, no, he's not a serious, serious scientist. If for you, a serious scientist who is opening uh, new discoveries on the intersection of the different fields, that's what he definitely does. So I call him serious scientist from the second point of view. In which conditions we can outperform one slash uh, divided by n portfolio? Uh, this is what we're going to do today many, many, many times. Can you explain more about portfolio constructions? Yeah, I think just give a note. For example, you have a choice of uh, all stocks on the all the American exchanges, London exchange, Hong Kong exchange, uh, European exchanges, and basically you want to invest. You have one million of dollars and you want to allocate this million of dollars through different assets in such a way. So this portfolio uh, is basically following some of your goals. Your goal can be super, super growth. Basically, you don't care about the risk, you just want to grow as fast as possible. Your goal can be, you want to be super safe. So basically, the safest as possible way is better. And based on this, you can pick the assets and the amount of the money you put of each asset to create basically your portfolio of the assets. This is what this portfolio construction is about. We'll talk about it. And also I wanted to show second link because uh, it's actual today and because we all live in this still even not post coronavirus, but actually coronavirus world. So it will be interesting to see, again, from Lopez de Prado, what uh, lessons he saw from the situation. All right. Basically lesson number one that he calls, 
more now casting, less forecasting. And again, what people do in the economics and finance, they do the forecasting. So basically all these models like uh, Arima, Arch, Garch, Exponential Smoothing, all these models that they can send inputs and trying to, for example, predict the price in the future. And uh, the problem is that uh, with this kind of approach, uh, you just kind of take the prices, for example, that uh, it's really doubtful that they reflect everything what this happens in the market. What you really want to do, you want to use data that is, let's say, another source of data that is not the prices in uh, order to not to predict something in the future, but to understand better what's happening now. And I can give you, basically, this is the example. Uh, in some strategies, you want to predict the, infl the inflation rate. And basically, or to have the actual information about the inflation rate in, such, uh, in some country, for example, or globally. And uh, how I do it, the government or some related financial institution, for example, every month, every year, every quarter, is relating the report about the inflation. Basically, they're analyzing a lot of information, they're doing some statistics, and say, this is the inflation rate today. But, uh, and based on these numbers, you can have some model formula that does forecasting. But what you really want to do, you want to be faster than ever. You don't want to wait for any, any reports. And uh, what can you use as the, let's say, approximate for the inflation rate? Basically, uh, what data source can you use that is not directly inflationary, but this is sort of the proxy from the inflation rate? What is the inflation? It is the prices are growing for something and people may be starting to buy less. This is some sort of effects that you might observe. And one of the places where you can observe such effects is, for example, Amazon. You can, in real time, parse the prices. Uh, also, you can, uh, with some hacks and tricks, analyzing how much and how many things that people are buying. And by this, you can build your own proxy for the inflation rate here. You can build your own formula that said that in real time. So you can see on the picture, it correlates very good from the official reports. And basically, that's what people are already doing, for example, in the, when they forecast the weather, they are not really like doing the forecasting for hours or months ahead. They're analyzing the situation at the moment using some very many different variables. And uh, in practice, also, what also happens in the finance, for example, this is all about this from the field of anal analyzing the alternative data. For example, you want to, you work in the investment bank and you know that the, uh, some company might grow in price if it will be, if this company will merge with some another company, if it will acquire some interest in startup. And if you analyze the flights of the investors, of the CEOs, uh, to some different regions, you can try to forecast the activity of merging acquisitions. And this is what people actually were doing. Also, for example, there were cases in China where we analyzed, you can also analyze satellite images and the activities of the factories. And basically, it's very different what Chinese, uh, some of the Chinese factories they put in the official reports and the activities that are actually, you can observe from the satellite images. And again, uh, people were saying that the coronavirus market crash was a black swan, like, oops, it couldn't be expected, it couldn't be forecasted. Of course, it couldn't be forecasted. It couldn't be forecasted with the econometrical models. It would, couldn't actually be forecasted with the machine learning models. But if you do the now casting, if we analyze in real time the different alternative sources of data, not just things from the market, we can see that uh, if you take the time series, for example, of the Cooper price, and uh, let's consider SPX as some sort of market behavior, we can see that uh, we could see that Cooper price fell much earlier, all the market-related crashes. And uh, why it could be for us a sign that something gonna be wrong with the market, because this affects the supply chain. And basically the market crashed and it wasn't just a black swan. If you could analyze the causal relationships that when supply chain breaks, then the, most of the economies, and first of all, American economy will be affected. And that's what we later we saw in the market prices.
but so it wasn't really black swan it could be analyzed not forecasted but as the Prado says now casted second lesson is about developing series and trading rules because uh, again people like to do the forecasting train the models and uh, then just use these models for the development and trading rules we back test it and then we say well if i do the neural network based on the volatility prices and sentiment analysis it gives me sharp ratio which is the or for example performance of 10 percent per month wow super cool but basically this is just one of the sort of the overfit because this finding is not explainable at all that's what the product is saying and this is like the one of the ideas of the why you want to have the uh, feature importance that's why we're going to tomorrow that's uh, you need to be able to explain your models. You need to build this theory. And for example, if you, even if you train this neural network on a lot of data, later you want to see that the cause-effect relationship is that, yes, yeah, so when the volatility and sentiment go up, then maybe the price go up. But uh, uh, yeah, maybe it's not the correlation that is that effect that's captured by non-linear effects in the neural network, but still you need to recover these effects. You need to explain them and then say, yeah, this is my theory. And the theory, is backed by the empirical results of a neural network, something like this. So just doing back testing as a result is not enough. And uh, also the thing that is interesting, we'll touch it a bit, that uh, uh, no strategy will uh, work, you know, just, okay, you fit the model, you can explain it, and then it works in all the conditions of the markets. It also doesn't work. It's just like the hope that people want to do that, uh, uh like i'll just build a strategy once it will work all the time that's unfortunately is far from the reality uh all right let's go further with the slides uh financial data structures basically the topic of the course usually what are the inputs uh, I'm talking now about the really like wide range financial data structures, not narrowing down to the investments. So, for example, when we talk about the banks, there's information about the clients, about transactions, etc., etc., etc. There's also called fundamental data. Basically, when you, there is a company and you want to say, okay, this company is public and it has some price on the market, what what is kind of building this price on what is by this price and it, because this company owns some assets it also has some liabilities this company has some sales has some earnings etc 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 and when you go to the market which is full of such public companies or another financial instruments we see the prices we see the trade volumes we see the dividends that this uh, companies are paying we see the interest we see the capitalization etc 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 there are also people and companies for analyzing all this data. So there's a lot of recommendations, credit rankings, uh, reports. There's also new sentiment. We can consider crowd uh, as a, also some sort of like crowd analytics. And also we touched a bit today the alternative data. For example, CCTV cameras that can track some activity around the shopping malls. So whatever walmart is saying the official reports from the cctv cameras next to the walmarts we can always actually say how many people are entering without the bags and coming out with the bags so this is the real activity in the walmart the same about the satellite images and the chinese factories amazon sales as the proxy for the inflation twitter etc 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 and as you can see i kind of ranked the data sources here based on their complexity with the green uh, yellow and red and start with the green basically we're talking about the clients information transaction or credit ranking this is relatively simple tabular data and why i'm saying relatively simple because it is not really stochastic so basically when i'm talking about the client information if i have the client profile basically i know this is the person who is client of the bank and uh, his gender age his or her gender age uh, uh, account properties, how much amount here she has on the account. Uh, uh, it's kind of, it's not stochastic. It's like the number of the, on your account, it's always the number of your account. And uh, for example, the transaction, if I send money to you, it's kind of always a transaction. Yeah, the properties of the transaction can change, but still as a transaction, it's not really stochastic. It has some fixed structure of this data. 
the same about the, for example, recommendations or uh, credit rankings. Uh, also, this the tables and the reports from the analysts. They're relatively they mean the same all the time. If you talk about the new sentiment, for example, data from the Twitter or the CCTV, why it's yellow, it's a bit more difficult to analyze because this is unstructured data. This data is not in the tables. And you need to perform some, let's say, model heavy lifting to extract the signals. For example, when you're on the Twitter and uh, you want to extract uh, some uh, keywords, sentiment, uh, uh, intents of the investors, maybe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you need to run some NLP machinery, and this is uh, not so straightforward. Uh, the same with the satellite images or the CCTV cameras, you want to run the convolutional neural networks to recognize its activity. So that's why it's not that easy. Uh, and why I put all these assets, liabilities, sales, price, volumes as the red category, because this data, in fact, is stochastic data. We know from theory that these values are actually modeled because, for example, client information is modeled as the normal table. Stat images is modeled as normal images. But for example, white prices, for example, I always model some Brownian motions or more complicated stochastic models. The same about the sales or liabilities. And uh, the thing is that when you have random input, it's sort of the trash input and trash in, trash out. That's what we know from the machine learning. And that's why this is the red zone and this is what we are going to, this, this will be the main focus of this course because how to work with the tables you know it guys already there is the like the any machine learning book tells you how to work with the tabular data you normalize it run some gradient boosting and you got your result about images and text i don't need to talk you this because you can run bird you can run the rest nets dense net or another state of the art computer vision models and you'll get your results but how to work with with essentially random data this is what we're gonna study in these days and the same about the outputs. Basically, some outputs can uh, always have relatively clear the same meaning. Fraud is always a fraud. Default is always default. Uh, cluster of the customer is always cluster of the customer. But for example, uh, to learn the factors that are driving the market, there's really not that straightforward. And to define the regime change point, for example, it was the big market that was growing, but how to find a point where market actually, actually changed the behavior. It's not that easy because you need to kind of really understand what is the behavior change and it's kind of hard. And talking about the price forecasting, this is like uh, terra incognita because price is random and you can't really do this. And this is the main financial data structures and these are the related, pro not the problems, but difficulties. Let's discuss it uh, for a while, basically. Uh, let's talk about, about a bit about the questions. Now, I see I skipped some, some questions here. And which role from the slide does a computer graduate fit in? I think computer scientists uh, with digging a bit into mathematics can be basically the feature developer or the strategist. That's the main thing to do. Uh, regarding looking at alternative data and now casting, like in the sea of like history, is this type of data really publicly available? Of course, no. Good data is never, never really publicly available. That's why if you expect to do something really, really good with the data from the Yahoo Finance, it's uh, a bit utopic because there are hundreds of thousands of people like you trying to extract the same patterns. And that's why this kind of strategies, that's why they have no liquidity because you all guys are gonna do the same. And in the same time, you're gonna do, go to the market with the same orders and there will be no counterpart to cover your orders. That's why it's, uh, if you really want good strategies, you really need alternative data. And it's, uh, or it anyway costs money because or you need to parse Twitter, which you need to hire some developers to do it, or you need to buy good data. Am I right affirming that backtesting is about comparing the predictions with the real successes failures of the usage of practice? Uh, in a way, yes, uh, backtesting is about when you build your strategy. For example, you have a model that predicts the price. You have a rule over it that, for example, if the forecast is bigger than 0 0.5, I buy this asset. 
and if the price is if the forecast is less i sell this asset and then you run this model and this rule over some set of data and then you check performance of your strategy uh, on this data so basically you see some sort of curve that for example if you've got it right it goes up and if you've got it wrong it goes down uh, maybe more questions Or everything clear so again it's everything is clear let's just not waste the time and i'll go forward just um this is like basically the essential part what roles we have and what data this role work with so maybe it's clear so we can move forward just give me a sign that we're okay to go I'm also trying to check uh, all the chats where the questions might appear. That seems like... Seems like we're good to go if there is no questions. All right. Uh, the main thing we really, really, really have to do now is to rethink a bit the whole framework of learning and modeling. So if we work with a computer vision or NLP, it's kind of clear what we optimize for. We optimize for the accuracy uh, or mean squared error on the out of sample data. It's kind of clear. That's why we have the well, that metrics. We have the test data set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you want to make a portfolio, when we do the investment management, and essentially I'm talking about the task when we have the, some universe of the, for example, stock, stocks or options or another instruments or cryptos or some private equities, maybe you want to buy a piece of your friend's company, uh, basically, and you have a lot of choices and you have one million of dollars or one billion. And how do you allocate your capital to these different pieces who actually have different risks? Uh, they have different properties, or maybe you just uh, buy the bonds from the government, which is kind of like the safest way, or maybe you just, you know, put this money to the bank with some one percent interest and just forget about it. Maybe that's the most optimal thing for you. So, what we actually optimize for when in it's not really clear yet for us because uh, in machine learning we have some accuracy like function maybe accuracy maybe some thing that measures good the prediction but when we have the portfolio it's not actually about the predictions it you can say it's more about the understanding the market because if you understand we have the structure of the market we kind of can, based on the structure, we can allocate the assets well. And this is not really about the predictions because you want to know what is the market and how to allocate things. So it's more about, more about understanding than predictions for now. Uh, accuracy, as you know, is not a differentiable function. So normally when we optimize for accuracy in machine learning, we, for example, minimize the log loss function or mean squared error or something like this. If you talk about the portfolio again, okay, so you want to optimize for what? What is the function you want to minimize or maximize in the future, of course? So it's also not super clear. Of course, you can say that uh, you want to maximize the returns, the performance, the final amount of money you have from your portfolio. So this way you kind of want to pick the assets that will be growing a lot. But this way you maybe forget about the risk so because uh, the assets that grow in the most like cryptocurrency is also super risky so then you want to at the same time maximize the performance that minimize the risks and uh, then the question how do you measure this risk uh, so it's also not clear and also there's also business metrics because okay it's still not clear what you want, want to optimize for is it returns is it the risk or you want to protect yourself from some maximal potential loss you want to have some 
down barrier, you can never go below it. Or maybe you just want to diversify your assets. So maybe for you, it's even doesn't really matter the performance. You just really want to have it spread through the super different and correlated things. And you just, you know, you have a bit in crypto, a bit in uh, uh, American stocks, a bit in European stocks, a bit in the uh, in the housing, and you just kind of feel safe because you have all your all your eggs in different baskets. And even doesn't matter how these baskets perform, you just kind of feel safe because of this. It is also okay. And uh, you see, we have kind of very many questions, and we will start answering these questions right now. Uh, but before answering these questions, let's one, make one step back to the process of the in, like portfolio selection. And uh, I'm saying for the retirement because, for example, uh, there are a lot of pension funds that are actually doing what we are doing right now. So this is like retirement. It's like the common goal. It's like you invest now to have some amount of the money in the future that will allow you to feel good in the retirement. Basically, this is kind of the thing. First, you need to select the universe of the financial instruments. And here, this is the choice that uh, you can do by yourself as a human expert, or if you want to rely on some mathematics or machine learning, you need to define the measure of goodness for you. For example, universe should be growing. Of course, you don't want to invest in the industry that is not growing. Uh, it should be diversified, so basically, uh, if your portfolio is constructed only from the American technological social network companies, uh, if one day social media will not be cool anymore, all your retirement portfolio is in danger. And it should be relatively calm and predictable. Uh, and predictable. So basically your set of assets has to be relied at least on something. There must be some factor exposure. So basically, there must be some things that explain your asset behavior. So, for example, uh, when you when we in and the factors can be very different. The couple factors can be, for example, the value. So, for example, this is the assets of the company. This is the sales of the company. This is the good, strong characteristics of the company. Uh, another factor can be, for example, you want to say that uh, I want to invest in the small companies. Because empirically, it was shown that actually small companies, they are more, uh, if you invest in the portfolio of the small companies, it uh, can outperform the big companies because small companies tend to grow more. And this is kind of your factor, your exposure. You're like exposed to the small companies or you're exposed to the value or you're exposed to the growth or you're exposed, for example, to the crowds. And it's also completely okay because maybe if you are the media person and you understand how the crowds work and you, you want a portfolio that is based on the wisdom of the crowd. So based on this, maybe you are not going to choose the gold or the governmental bonds because they're not really based on the wisdom of the crowds, but you can choose crypto and companies like Tesla that are driven by the Twitter of Elon Musk. And that's completely fine. That's your factor exposure. Uh, then you want to select your allocation scheme. For example, the allocation scheme after you selected your assets uh, that have some one or several factor exposures, you want this uh, not bet every single one horse. You want to put your eggs in different baskets. And for example, you can just, if you have selected uh, 100 of the stocks, you can say, okay, okay, for each of the stocks, I put 1% of my capital or you can have another allocation scheme. Basically, you can say, I want to put on the big companies a bit more and the small companies a bit less. This is like the cap, capitalization-based allocation or something like this. And then you also want to select some final investment goal. It, it can be for something like, for example, in 50 years from now, I want to have 10 millions of dollars in a bank account. Or for example, I just want to grow my returns but minimize the rings. The goals can be very, very, very different. And then taking all this together, you run some sort of optimization. That uh, optimi optimization with respect to the allocation scheme or allocation scheme strategy is dynamic. So basically as a result, or you have your allocation, so basically you have a vector of the weights for each of the assets where you say, for example, I put 1% uh, to the Tesla, 2% to the Microsoft, 10% to the crypto. And this is your result of your optimization because you found this to be optimal 
on the data set with respect to your goal, for example, maximization of the returns. Or it can be the policy, and this is uh, something that is a bit more complicated. The policy is, for example, each month you change your allocation a bit with respect to the changes of the market. But this is something that is a bit more complicated, but obviously still doable, and we're going to discuss it today as well. And how to measure, for example, such growth and risks. And the most, most, most primitive uh, measures are of the growth are returns. So basically, return on the time t is price of the time t minus previous price divided by this previous time. So basically, this is the percentage of how this particular asset grows with respect to some time delta. And the variance is basically also when the sigma, for example, is a covariance matrix. Basically, here the sigma on in the form on the right, and uh, omega uh, are the weights of your portfolio. Basically, this is how you can measure the variance of your portfolio based on the covariance matrix and the weights you allocated on this covariance matrix. And basically, the higher is the variance, obviously, the more risky your portfolio is, and uh, the more the bigger returns the big, the more you earn. This is like the most primitive metrics you want to track. Explainability by the factors. There are several interesting uh, models that basically they're trying to predict the growth or basically to explain the price on the market based on something useful, based on some feature. And the, the first econometrical model that appeared was called the capital asset price model. And for example, R E return of some asset E basically equals RF, which is risk-free rate. Usually in the theories, basically most, if you are from the finance or economics world, you know this, that the models are built in such a way. So basically the, the return of some asset has to be in a way at least bigger than the risk-free rate, because what's the point of investing in the stock market if you can just invest, for example, in the governmental bond, or you can just give money to the bank, which gives you 1%. And this 1%, which kind of like, risk-free it's like uh, you will get this one percent anyway so basically obviously if people are risking investing in the stocks they expect and the market expects to get more than just this one percent the band so this is like this risk-free rate plus beta multiplied by whole market return minus this risk-free rate so basically as you can see the main and risk rate is obviously something that is fixed, is the fixed variable. So basically you can see that your return of your particular asset equals in a way to, if risk free rate is equals to zero, it equals to beta i multiplied by market return. So basically this beta is your exposure to the whole market. So basically capital asset market pricing model says that the individual asset is basically the price of this individual asset can be forecasted based on the price of the market, basically the growth of the returns of the market. I'm sorry, we shouldn't say the price, the return of individual asset can be forecasted based on the whole market return. Of course, this is something what is not really realistic assumption because you know market can go up, but the asset can go down. It's, it, that's what happens all the time. So for example, the next model is a bit more complicated, was invented by Fama and French. And here the return is already based on the three factors and for example uh, okay there's still risk free rate then you can see that the first thing is uh, basically the market return km and then there are two things that are basically they represent size of the company and value of the company and uh, because farm and french they saw that for example the small companies small capitalization companies are growing faster than the big ones and the value is also basically the value based, uh, the value of the company is also the, the more the value, the more it grows. So basically this is like the examples of the formulas that can explain the returns. And basically, even if you do some complicated machine learning, that's for example, if you saw one of the slides, you want to do the feature importance to understand what is your factor exposure because you will know that, for example, you want to invest in the big value companies like Coca-Cola or McDonald's, and that's what Warren Buffett does. You want to invest in the low capitalization, the small, relatively small businesses because they tend to grow more or something like this. 
uh, this is some examples. And in our case, what we ultimately want to have is so to say some deep learning model or something like this, but it should be explainable. So basically we want to explain the returns of our asset based on some features. Then what, what can be allocation schemes and diversification? Basically, for example, capitalization based is uh, when you make the percentage of your capital you put on each asset based on the capitalization, so to say size of the company. But it can be the problem. For example, if you were a Finnish uh, pension fund uh, like, what, 10, 15 years ago, uh, one of the biggest Finnish companies was Nokia. And it could happen that like, uh, in, you could rely your pension mostly on the Nokia. But we know that Nokia is not really a good situation at the moment. So maybe capitalization based is not always the good choice. Equal allocation is something what uh, is in a way more safe, you just put equally, equal amount of the X in all the different baskets and this way you can feel more or less free. There also can be a bit other measures for risk diversification because uh, also when you put the equal amount of money, it doesn't mean that you, that you put into equal amount of risk because some assets are more risky, some assets are less risky and uh, maybe you want to diversify in another way. And this is kind of your choice to do. And uh, at the end, you want to measure some performance metrics. And one of the, it's a standard choice you do is called Sharpe ratio. Basically it's expected returns. Basically this, you calculate the returns of your portfolio. And most of them, if the most of them are positive returns, it means the portfolio was growing. So expected return can be, for example, 3%, like the average return on your data. Divide you some risk, for example, uh, and this is how you get in a way. And if you maximize the sharp ratio, you maximize the returns and minimize some risk. That's what's called risk adjusted returns. And uh, how do we, what will be the risk? It's actually a very good question because you can measure risk in very, very many different ways. It can be not just the volatility, not just the variance of the market. It can be, for example, the drawdown. It can be some many, many interesting things. And that's why this shower pressure can turn into many different other ratios, but for us now, this looks just fine. Some return divided by the risk. And now we'll go through the, okay, let's answer your questions for a while and we'll go with the classical approaches. Uh, okay, 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 okay. How much of the strategies can be automated? What's the role of the analyst here? Basically, I think all the strategies can be automated, but uh, the analyst is the person who understands the market and the person who basically selects the, uh, the features for what's driving the market. For example, data engineers, data scientists, uh, so they normally, they don't study the market. And the analyst is the one who is saying, this crypto market, this particular cryptocurrencies are driven by the sentiment from Twitter. The data engineer is parsing the Twitter. Data scientist is making the strategy from this uh, parse data, etc., etc. I missed what is OOS data. OOS is out of sample. So basically, this is the data that when we were doing the modeling, the optimization, this is the some data that we weren't optimizing for. So. For example, we are optimizing on some historical data, of course, because that's what we see, but out of sample is in our case, for example, future data. You want to increase returns and decrease variance. Yes, basically that's what we want to do. We want to earn more, but at the same time, we want to limit ourselves to the risk. What is the potential of reinforcement learning the portfolio optimization? Has it any chance to be popular and usable in the nearest future? It is popular and it is used in the nearest future. Uh, because of the main reason, because market conditions are changing all the time. And uh, we cannot just, you know, when we optimize, let's say this normal optimi optimizer, we found just one set of weights and we can use it for all the time in the future. But in reality, you want to kind of review your views on the market and we'll see it today as well. By how much the market inefficiency can violate the series and how to deal with this randomness? Uh, basically, all these theories are in a way empirical and uh, basically market, ineffic market efficiency and efficiency is also a theory. So basically, 
uh, if we say that the uh, market is inefficient, then yeah, we can find some things how to exploit the market. If we say that market is efficient, we can't exploit the market, but uh, uh, it's also a theory. And I think that something what is a bit uh, irrelevant because uh, this randomness is not really a randomness because uh, again, we will see, I think not today, but tomorrow, uh, randomness is not really a randomness. It's uh, still some process that has some properties. And for example, the randomness of Tesla stock can be explained by some things. The randomness of the inflation, inflation rate, rate can be explained. And all these randomnesses, they can be really well described by different models. And that's why, for example, uh, still pension funds are growing. That's why the stock markets are growing because we can explain this randomness with something. That's why, for example, in the slides I'm saying we need, we want to have some exposure factors that explain this randomness. Why sharp ratio is still used when there is certain ratio which doesn't specialize for the uh, positive volatility? Uh, because for some classes of investors, uh, the big uh, jumps up are also not really good. And uh, basically there are some classes of investors that uh, just want to have their portfolio kind of almost as a straight line, so it's a strategy. Not uh, every investor is uh, maximizing for the returns. Some maximizing for the diversification. For some people, the portfolio can actually even go down. But if, uh, if uh, while it's well diversified, it's still okay. That, that's why we want to see this, uh, uh, this pipeline again. The, the goals and allocation schemes can be really, really very different. And that's why we have this kind of generalized framework so we can have uh, any data, any factors, any allocation scheme, and any goal, and then we just optimize for it. Right. Uh, okay. Now let's 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 talk a bit about the classical approaches. If there is no questions left. All right, what are the most of the classical approaches about? Basically, we discussed that we have optimization task. And if it's optimization task, what happens? That uh, we have some variable of uh, interest uh, that uh, we want to, we do optimization with respect to some variable. In our case, this variable is the vector of the weights in the portfolio. And uh, there, can, there can be like very, very, very many options of the different combinations of the weights. And uh, we can do, for example, random search and choose which vector of these weights uh, can be maximizing our goal or minimizing some risk or something like this. And uh, one of the, let's say, interesting properties also in choosing the portfolio before we some optimization there is like it's also called the only free lunch in finance we all are interested in having less risks and if you consider volatility as the main risk the only thing that we can kind of expect to have the more the correlated assets you have in the portfolio the lower will be the whole volatility of the portfolio. This is the only thing we can rely on. And, uh, but as you can see, it tells us nothing about the exact values. It tells us nothing about like uh, uh, how much we're going to earn, etc., etc. And uh, Markowitz was one of the scientists and the uh, winners of the Nobel prizes that uh, turned the idea of uh, like having this universe of the assets and uh, represented as the weights that we can actually plot them on two-dimensional graph. And the two-dimensional graph has two axes that one of them is basically the risk, standard deviation, volatility, or some other measure of risk, and expected return, uh, which goes from low to high in most of the cases, uh, in both axes. And uh, the dots on this graph, basically they represent the different portfolios. And for example, if you do some sort of Monte Carlo sampling, if you just sample many, many random sets of weights, they will look as some sort of like a cloud of the different portfolios in the picture. 
and uh, what we are really interested in in some sort of the frontier the efficient frontier on the very 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 like kind of the side of this portfolios because on the actually on the side of the portfolios there are the the dots so basically the particular portfolios uh, that uh, maximizes the return for some given level of risk and let me explain you uh, what I mean by this just let me, let me try to do one thing difficult like this moment because I can see the people uh, so okay sorry okay let me do it in a simple way so basically what I what I mean what I mean by uh, that we have for any given level of risk we have some maximized return for example this is our desired level of risk we can't afford volatility more than some value of five for example and exactly here will be the portfolio that has the maximal return for this exact value of risk and for example if you want to have risk to be of zero three or something your portfolio again optimal portfolio in terms of maximize return will also lie on this line so basically the sufficient frontier is something you can choose uh, or for example your desired target volatility desired risk is like i don't want to go more than this risk and there is basically only one portfolio exactly on the outer line of all the portfolios that corresponds that corresponds to the maximum possible return based on this risk and you can do actually vice versa you can select your desired return here for example you want to make 10 percent or something and here you can choose the best portfolio in terms of risk so for example if you choose this portfolio it will be the less risky portfolio that gives you 10% of the expected return. Because if you choose something here, it already have more risk. Or here also already has more risk. The same about the volatility. For example, if you want to have desired volatility of five, if you choose the portfolio this one, it will have less return than you could have. So basically this is, uh, this is like the, uh, the idea as you can see there is one major problem with this approach that uh, how do you calculate you calculate on the historical data uh, but we'll come to this issue a bit later so basically when we understand this that we can represent the set of our portfolios with some sort of cloud and this cloud will have some efficient frontier on this side uh, we want to maximize for some value or minimize for some value so basically uh, one of the portfolios that you might looking for is the portfolio with the minimal possible volatility it's like you don't care about the returns but you want to have the minimal possible volatility and how do you do it uh, first remember there is such a thing that is called uh, convex optimization uh, it can be solved with uh, many different algorithms from something theoretical like simplex method, from uh, it could be some gradient-based approaches, it could be some genetic algorithms. Uh, so basically, want to optimize some utility function with respect to some inequalities. Uh, the toolbox basically you can use it as the black box with CPy or some other Python libraries. But basically, what you can see on the right, if you want to minimize the risk of your portfolio, basically you want to minimize the function that where the big sigma is the covariance matrix and when you multiply your weights for your covariance matrix uh, basically you get your volatility that's the definition and uh, you want to minimize this volatility of your portfolio with respect to having the sum of the weights equal to one because basically you want to allocate 
all 100% of your portfolio. And obviously you can't allocate more than 100% of your portfolio. Uh, if you talk about, let's say, normal situation, this is all that you can have. And also you can have the desired return target, just as we reviewed here. You want to minimize your risk for some particular expected return mu t. So at the, at the end, the last condition you want to have is when you multiply the returns from the market by your weights. So basically returns of this individual assets, you multiply them by the weight, you kind of get the return of your portfolio together, right? Because for example, uh, the Apple stock gives you plus 5%, uh, Tesla gives, gives you plus 10%, crypto gives you plus 20%, oil gave you minus 10%, and you multiply all this value by the weights of your portfolio, uh, like 5% to the Tesla, 50% to the oil, or something like this. And then when you multiply it, you get your return of your portfolio altogether. So you define some value of your portfolio, like I go for 10% return. I want such weights that go for 10% return, my weights, weights have to be summed to one, so it's like 100 of the weights, and I want to minimize my risk based on these things. Also, uh, as we can see, there's also one uh, another interesting property that comes from this graph. If you're talking about the risk-adjusted return, there is one optimal point in this portfolio that is that saying us that this is the maximum return with the maximum risk. So this point is some sort of the maximal sharp point. This is the best portfolio we can get here from this point of view. Because uh, if you go a bit higher with the return, you'll have more risk. And if you get uh, lower with the risk, you have lower return. So this is like the optimal point. So like basically this point you can get by uh, dividing uh, returns by the volatility. And you can also, optimize for this for the maximum sharp and as you can see uh, you want to maximize maximize again with the set of weights omega where uh, you already have what are your inputs here basically you have the inputs as mu transposed which is basically the returns on your on your data returns returns expected returns of your stocks of your instruments multiply by your weights that you want to find the optimal ones minus risk-free rate because you always kind of want to do the risk rate. And you divide it by the, basically the square root of your risk. So basically it's like, this is the definition of the sharp ratio. With respect to having all weights, sum to one. And for example, in this case, they also want uh, all individual weights to be more than zero. Uh, um, yeah. For example, it means that we are going all long because, for example, if we had weights, uh, if we can allow weights being less than zero, it means that we can put some minus weight to some of the assets. And uh, if you just kind of buy and wait for it, you can't buy negative amount of the assets. But you also can short assets, but that's a bit another story. Uh, but this problem is not convex, for example, as you can see. So, for example, to maximize this function, you might want to use some, uh, let's say, non-convex optimizer or with some mathematical tricks and can be transformed to the convex function but yeah, this is a bit out of the scope it's not that important right now uh, okay so basically this is how we can find the portfolios that are focusing on the particular return and particular risk but as we just discussed before that's not the goal of every investor some people want just to diversify these assets and it's also a viable strategy. Moreover, you also can show that uh, diversification can also have really, really nice uh, properties, nice sharp ratios uh, or nice other interesting properties. So one of the very, very naive diversification can look like basically the idea is don't put to all X in a, a single basket. And uh, What's the problem? For example, naive diversification is, uh, if I have 100 assets, I put 1% of my capital in each of the assets. But uh, as we discussed before, for example, mm, sorry, 
yeah, basically this where you can leave the reciprocation. And there is a formal that's called the like effective number of constituents that measures this diversification and uh, it also has a degree of freedom. For example, if you put uh, alpha equals to two into this formula, what you'll have? You basically, you'll have that uh, you want to put uh, kind of basically one divided by the number of the weights, a number of the assets to each asset. So basically it's alpha equal two in this formula, you get one divided by n, which is like the most primitive allocation, but you can scale it. As you can see with the alpha, you can scale this formula. Uh, why we want it? Because with the sharp portfolio, for example, we can have, uh, even when we optimize it, we can have such a portfolio when from all 100 assets we have, we can heavily invest in three. And all other 97 have super, super small percentage or even no percentage, which is basically means, okay, your portfolio is good from the sharp point of view, or from the return point of view, but it's not diversified at all. And uh, if you something happens with the stocks that are growing now or opting from the sharp now, you fail horribly later. Another idea of the diversification is basically to apply the same, but here, for example, we optimize for having equality of the value, basically value of the weight. So basically, in the alpha equals to two, you want to have, uh, in case of 100 assets, 1% 1 for uh, each of the assets. Another problem that uh, even if you put 1% of the, of the each assets, uh, some of the assets can be very risky and uh, some of the assets can be not risky at all. So, okay, you diversified your, from the dollar point of view, but you didn't diversify from the risk point of view. And you can apply literally the same formula, but uh, now ranking each asset not from the point of view how much money you put on this asset but how much risk gives you this asset and uh, for example i mentioned portfolio which has like uh, uh, half of the portfolio is in a risky asset with 30 percent volatility and uh, some not risky bond with 10 percent volatility yeah it's like uh, equal allocation 50 50 the efficient number of the constituents equals to uh, two, so basically you have two assets, but uh, two assets, two portfolios, okay, you split it equally, but uh, they're completely not equal from the risk point of view, so you're risking a lot to lose into the risky asset compared to the bond. And instead of stacking and kind of dividing and normalizing for the weights in the asset, you can do the same for the volatility. And basically you can see the formula stays the same, just instead of uh, having this omega, which is corresponding for the weights, and you want to have equal omega. You want to have equal Q, where Q is basically risk contribution. But the idea is, uh, is literally the same. Another options can be, as you already saw, it can be minimal variance, that can be maximum diversification, again, maximum decorrelation. For example, you want uh, to spread your portfolio into maximum not correlated assets as possible as, as you want. So the idea here that A here is this correlation matrix and uh, you and you want to minimize the correlation in the correlation matrix between your assets, right? So basically, if your correlations, pairwise correlations are low, you minimize this matrix. Uh, so you basically, you minimize the correlations in the portfolio. Of course, the matrix stays the same, but you minimize the contribution. So basically, that's what you can do. And uh, one very, very, very cool point about this framework. So basically we saw this, for example, minimizing the risk with respect to some target return, minimizing, uh, maximizing sharp ratio, uh, maximizing diversification. So basically we can maximize this value E and C. We can maximize this E and C B. We can also have many different other things that we can track. The coolest point is that when we deal with the optimization framework, we can stack these functions together. So basically you easily can say, I want to maximize my sharp ratio and maximize E and C and maximize the correlation. 
basically how to combine the things. Obviously, first you want to put it in kind of like the same uh, scope of the, for example, it should be like one function. So, so I want to do like arg max with respect to the weights and something in the brackets. So for example, if the originally it's uh, minimization, you want to put minus here and minimizing negative of some function, you're gonna maximize it. So this is how you put it all together to minimize everything or to maximize everything. This is point number one. Point number second, you can actually, in a really cool way, balance between these functions. So for example, you can, uh, okay, select like a minimization and you are minimizing minus sharp, so you can maximize in sharp, plus you are minimizing this decorrelation thing multiplied by some factor 0 0.1. So this is kind of like a regularizer for you. So basically that's the idea. You want to maximize sharp, but regularize the sharp with, for example, uh, ENCB or with decorrelation. Basically, this is what you do actually in the machine learning. You minimize the log loss, but at the same time, you add some uh, uh, additional point, which where, for example, you minimize the now with the scale of the weights with L1, L2 regularization. The same thing is the same because when you have the optimization, you can stack this function and uh, basically that's what you can do. Let's uh, discuss this part for a while because I think this is uh, relatively simple, but uh, not super simple. What represent these weights? The vector of the weights, where each element of the weight tells you how much money you want to put on this asset. So, for example, imagine a portfolio from the Apple stock and Tesla stock. And the vector of weight is 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. It means that I put 50% of all my money to the Apple stock and another 50% of the money to the Tesla stock. If I had 30, 70, I would say 30% go to the Apple stock and 70% to the Tesla stock. In case of 100 assets, I have the vector of the size 100 with each element of the vector representing how much of my capital, of my money, I put to, the, to this particular asset. How to compute the risk of some asset? Basically, one of the relatively standard options is choosing the, the volatility. So basically, you use covariance matrix multiplied by the weights, squared weights, and this is how you get the volatility of, the, of your portfolio. And the lower volatility you have, the less uh, risk you have. This is what uh, one of the choices for the risk. But again, when you have the practical, the lab session, we're going to review many, many, many others. I'll go a bit further and you please keep asking the questions. All right, so we define the framework. We can now maximize, minimize many different functions. Um, the problem is that we do it all on the in sample data. So we do it on the old some historical data set. So basically, when we say expected risk and expected returns, what it actually means. And uh, normally, at least in this framework, we assume that we can't really forecast the returns. So basically, we just calculate the returns from the data. And we, okay, for example, if the apple grows 3% per year, we can assume that the expected growth will be 3%. And the same, we, can, we keep the fixed covariance matrix because covariance is how the assets move together, how much risk they have. Uh, so basically we consider this covariance matrix as also is the risk measure that kind of still stays the same. So we are kind of in a huge risk to overfit here. So that's why it's always good to track some additional metrics that uh, at least tell you if you're going good or well. For example, one of these metrics is information rate ratio. Uh, they introduce some benchmarks. So basically you calculate uh, how much gain you have over some benchmark. For example, the benchmark is equal allocation and you computed the maximal sharp ratio portfolio. And this is this formula you can actually track uh, how much you're better from the information point of view. Uh, you can also calculate maximal drawdown, which is also an interesting measure, which basically tells you uh, what is the maximal fail 
you have and also for example maximum drawdown period for example how long your portfolio stays under the water in the negative phase also can give you the nice insight about your portfolio and your its properties also factor exposure because uh, for example you have underlying model that predicts something and based on these predictions you run the strategy so as you can imagine uh, the market conditions changes and uh, when you evaluate some formula for example is this betas uh, over time the beta for example to the market can get higher or lower the beta to the value can get higher or lower so this is where you also can track it and you say your portfolio is like more value focused or less value focused it more some feature dependent or less some feature dependent and basically it also gives you interesting insights about the market also the sharp ratio the problem is that it also assumes that all the returns are normally distributed and uh, it gives us some uh, problems because we usually for example and we calculate uh, it uh, for example just for returns for a couple of years we don't have many data points to calculate the returns to calculate the sharp ratio so basically and uh, normally the prices can be skewed or have a, a fat tail returns which means like high kurtosis so we need to kind of make the fix for fat tails and the skewness and uh, basically probabilistic sharp it uh, basically makes some adjusted estimate of the sharp ratio like removing this effect of the normality and also adding the skewness basically as we see here uh, this uh, third and four statistical moments uh, basically adding them into the formula so we can get the correction uh, deflated sharp this is not a very interesting thing again i'll give you materials and you can read about it in detail so I'll just give you introduction to this formula to so these concepts again to prove that we are going to do the derivations of these formulas because we have not enough time i'm trying to give you more concepts and uh, all the materials when you can dive deeper into these concepts i'm just uh, showing okay there is a concept of not normality of the returns so we fix it this adding the third and four statistical elements to the formula deflated sharp there is a concept of the repeated experiments there is the idea in statistics that uh, the more and more you repeat the same experiment that involves some stochasticity uh, and for example you did 1000 trials that depend on one stochastic value and uh, you keep repeating repeating experiment and once you got some good number and you're like wow erica i found the portfolio that will grow 100 percent per year but in your kind of when you calculate a sharp pressure you would like to take into account that mm, i had 1000 of trials my trials were like this and uh, if i calculate this seemingly high sharp ratio I want to kind of take into account that before I had 1,000 experiments with slower sharp ratios. And maybe this high ratio kind of fits in the distribution of the others, maybe no. So we need to take this into account as well. And also interesting thing is like, uh, again, because of the not normality of the returns, uh, you want to have the estimate of the kind of track record. So you want to say, uh -huh. so i can trust this strategy if it shows this performance for example for at least two years and this formula gives you actually this amount of how many years you need to have need to observe the good performance of this strategy to consider it like trustable to have it, to have statistical confidence so basically if uh, the strategy has kind of like uh, crazy fat tails you really need to see maybe like 50 years of the good performance so to really trust it but for example if you have really nice normally shaped returns and uh, this nice normal distribution is the, is has the mean value of for example of one percent then you don't really need to expect it for a long time because the statistically it's a nice distribution of returns and you can actually trust it so this is like interesting metrics that you want to uh want to track and uh, one thing before we put it together into a strategy let's really have a session of the discussion because uh, there are like interesting concepts and they're kind of important so let's have at least five minutes of a discussion how do you compute the volatility that's guys what i showed you on one of the slides here this is how you compute the volatility of the your portfolio 
Uh, have you implemented any algo trading bots using these new ideas? Guys, uh, when talking about the algo trading bots, I uh, immediately have a bit like uh, a bit negative opinion about this because when people say like algo trading bots, it's usually something about like, wow, it's a bot that just works and earns money. Um, the kind of essence of quantitative research that it's not like you develop a bot and it kind of works for you. Uh, um, the bots that they were developed before, they actually were built without using these ideas. Basically, they were using, but they were working well because they're using alternative data. So basically, financial market was just one of the sources of data. It also had Twitter, also had, for example, GitHub. So for the crypto taken into account as a, as a data source, it, it could work pretty well. It was a couple of years ago, we didn't, didn't know about like cool smart ideas, but it's working fine thanks to alternative data. Uh, but the thing is that uh, it's like uh, the bot itself, one single bot, it in a way means nothing because uh, uh, you don't really want to allocate your money to one single bot because to the bot, you need to understand the exposure of the bot, you need to understand the, to what features exposed, you need to understand the risk. Basically, you want to track. Uh, this and many others metrics of the bot. You need to run simulations to check how the bot works. So basically, when you there is really hard to make uh, a single bot that you want to invest in. But as we saw here, the only free launch in the finance. When you have many decorrelated assets, you get a portfolio that is less risky. So when you have really really many uh, strategies which could be bots. They have to be really decorrelated. They have to rely on completely different series. And when you have 10, 20 bots that are completely different, and it's super hard to do, to have 20 completely decorrelated bots, and then you merge them into, for example, a maximum short portfolio, then when you can success. Please check out top ranked questions too. But I think I was already answered all of them. What is the potential for reinforcement learning? I already answered that. Sortino ratio, I answered that. So uh, I already answered these questions. I'm a second year undergraduate with occasional knowledge in ML. Uh, how do I get started in this? I have zero knowledge in economics, finance, and so books, extension, useful resources. Everything will be basically I planned to tomorrow in the end, I plan to give like the whole roadmap. So I hope everything will be answered. Basically, I have the whole roadmap, uh, kind of in a way from zero to from zero to making the strategies. No more questions. <clears throat> when I see no questions regarding the topic, uh, it means, uh, or it's too difficult, and uh, people even like don't understand what to ask, or it's too easy and it's boring for you guys. For example, basically, I just received not so many questions about uh, uh, the topic. For example, how to compute the volatility, what is the risk of the asset, what represents the weights. Okay, that was about the topic but uh, so for you guys it's clear basically uh, the idea of the optimization the idea of uh, taking some data calculating the expected returns of this uh, stocks which can be in our case can be for example just average return for 10 years and since we still don't know how to forecast we say okay we expect the apple to grow three percent every year uh, then we calculate the risk which is the covariance matrix. Uh, and we kind of play with it. We play with different objectives, with different, uh, we combine them, calculate the measures and... Uh, 
how can you oh how can you find good factors cps market cap value growth already known for all yeah basically that's that's the question of the research for example when uh, we were working in the crypto uh, we kind of we had an analyst the person who is the deep into crypto and uh, this person for example really is into the crypto market and for example when we were uh, getting the data from the telegram because this guy said the market is being pumped if you can get this telegram chats or people pump it we can get it we, that's that's how the market grows at least some alternative coins and that's how we did that was the factor it was for us it was basically the pumping factor and uh, basically how do you find the good factors actually there are like uh, three sources of the factors First one is the like so to say global factors, something like political, economical, something like very like macroeconomical. Second is some uh, like microeconomical factors. And for example, in crypto pumping is some sort of microeconomical factor. And also can be statistical factor. For example, if you are like uh, trying to extract some mathematical properties from the time series, but this is uh, something what I think is really hard. Is it ever possible to make sure it didn't overfit? If there is statistical evidence, a sort of profitable strategy was already eliminated by market efficiency. Is it f fair then to say when we calculate with everything, we still just make bet that will work in the future? Uh, basically, yes, you're right. Tomorrow when we, basically I wanted to talk a bit more about the overfitting tomorrow because tomorrow we're gonna to talk about and do forecasting with the machine learning. So overfitting machine learning is kind of a bit more close together and basically there are different ways how you can fight with overfitting um, I think let's I'll just let me just find the, the slide that talks very very clearly about how to fight how to I wouldn't say to fight the overfitting but uh, at least how to track the overfitting Okay, 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 we need to make a break soon. Okay, let's just answer a couple of questions and make a break. Mm, there was just a nice uh, map of the methods. So I just want to show you this map. Yeah, basically guys, if you can see the overfitting has like mainly two big sources. And first source is the training set. Basically this is this Think, for example, when we say the apple will grow 3% as we see in the training set, the covariance will still be the same as we see. This is like the, the problem having the training set. And what we can do, we can uh, generate synthetical data sets. We can kind of do resampling on our data. We can mix our data and have different synthetic data sets or sample with the Monte Carlo. Uh, we can apply some regularization and we can apply regularization not only to the machine learning models, for example, when I have the covariance matrix, it's a model of our risk. And as we will see a bit later, we can shrink the covariance matrix and say we'll kind of regularize the covariance matrix as a model of the risk. So this is what we can do with this, the data. And when we actually do the testing, for example, okay, we fit some models. And for example, model for expected return for us now is just the average of the return from the data. The covariance, okay, we can shrink covariance somehow. We kind of fit, do the optimization, and we got our weights, which is our strategy. Basically, strategy for us now is the set of weights. And when we do the test set, when we check the performance of our strategy, uh, how we can actually ensure that we didn't overfit. Report all the trials, trials, and then we have deflated sharp ratio. That's what I showed you, the formula for basically ensuring that uh, from all our tri trials, what we did, good result is not the overfit. And also we can actually generate a lot of different synthetic data sets, different synthetic samples. For example, okay, I, I have 10 years to fit my model, 10 years to have uh, one single backtesting, but then I can, for example, uh, this 10 years, I can kind of mix them inside and I can have a new 10 years, a new time series to the same statistical properties. I can run backtesting there. Uh, I can do some, uh, for example, I can train a gun and I can sample, the, or I can have this, some stochastic model, Brownian motion, et cetera, et cetera. I can simulate different price movements 
and the check how my strategy will perform there. If my weights, with, if for example, I can capture the statistical properties of the S&P 500 market, and I can simulate different, like different, uh, different alternative universe, Apple woman, etc. And I can check if my performance of the search still will go, be good. So there are tools how we can actually check it. The idea is clear, implementation is not. This is after the break, guys, we will do a lot of implementations. How do computer expected returns for new company stocks, for example? Uh, yeah, this is a bit separate question. For example, if the company is just like fresh from the IPO, uh, there are a bit different rules how to calculate expected returns. So your final goal is a long short portfolio, only long portfolio, or in the or is there any kind of other types of portfolios? Basically, long short portfolio it's also some sort of diversification. So basically. It's also the choice of the investor, something what people say, market neutrality. It's like, uh, I believe that uh, it's like, I want to have a portfolio where half, the, half of the things go down and I short them and half of the things go up and along them. So it's just the point of view of the investor. What's the relation between stochastic models and machine learning? Uh, stochastic models are designed to explain behavior of some stochastic processes in sample. So for example, geometric Brownian motion was uh, designed to explain and model some random movements based on their mean and standard deviation. Uh, there can be very many different models, uh, but uh, they are not really able to forecast anything. So stochastic model, just the formula. Machine learning is designed to predict things uh, out of sample and that's the main difference. Basically, they both model the data, but stochastic models are aimed kind of to replicate the data from the simulation point of view. Uh, machine learning is aimed to learn structure of the data from the prediction of the Samsung point of view. Can you provide some explanation of notations used in forums because it's difficult to catch the sense for not economists? Uh, thanks for the feedback. Yes, in the slides I'll do it, but uh, basically we have just got just two notations. R is the return, uh, omega is or W is the weight, big sigma is the covariance matrix. That's basically all the notations we have here. And oh, okay, we also had the mu once here. Mu is the returns. Yeah, you're right. I should uh, I should edit uh, when I'll upload the slides. I'll edit. Okay, guys, one more question and let's uh, make a break and uh, go and uh, have a snack, coffee, and, uh, and do actually the practice. One more question. No questions. All right, guys, if there is no questions, let's just uh, make a break and come back, uh, I guess, to the same link, right, in uh, half an hour. So have a run, have a nice break, and uh, talk to you very, very, very soon, right?
Guys, can you also put in the chat that... Uh... Да, да. Да, да, секунду. So we're good to go. Meanwhile, there is one more question. Raman asks if causal learning in economics, it's possible. I think it's not just possible, it's that's what we perfectly want to have because uh, neither uh, econometrical models uh, nor machine learning, it's not, I would say classical machine learning, it's not causal learning. So uh, basically it's through the Bayesian neural networks. I'm sure it's possible, but that's not really not really my area of expertise. I can recommend one book that I bought, but I didn't read yet. <laughs> Basically, it uh, covers the topics that kind of went through and it talks about Bayesian neural networks. So it's, it's definitely possible, it's doable. Uh, any more questions after the break, after snacks, coffee, maybe you realize that you want to ask something else? I'm going to wait, I don't know, maybe one, two minutes for the questions, and then we'll go to the practice. Guys, if everything is clear, could you please just maybe say like, uh, yeah, it's clear, we'll just go further, because I also need a sign out that, uh, again, because when I see no feedback, it means or everything is super easy, everything is super hard, and I don't see the feedback, it's a bit hard. Uh, because I can uh, obviously can repeat and try to explain another way or in the worst case if I can't explain something now I'll or send the links to the chat or I'll fix something in the slides etc so the feedback is uh, important If back test is only validation step, how to research and test factors? Aha, uh -huh. that's the question. We definitely, that's what we want to talk about tomorrow. How to research and test factors without back testing. That's, that's the topic for tomorrow because today we focus on the kind of more general framework. And basically, okay, it's a small spoiler, but basically at the end of the day, what we will see that, okay, we can build some portfolios, we can optimize for something. But the problem is that uh, we take our risk and reward purely from the historical data, which is obviously is wrong. We want to forecast both the risks and was both the returns. And we want to forecast it obviously with machine learning. And that's where we're gonna research and test factors, etc. All right, thanks for the feedback, guys. If everything's clear, I'll share the screen again and we'll go through some interesting, more interesting things. All right, basically, obviously, I'm gonna send you the, the notebook later. So what you have here? There's a data set of different ETFs. ETFs, it's also a financial institution instrument that contains in itself uh, basically you just consider it as a financial instrument that uh, costs something you can trade it that's it and also we have the us dollar so basically to simulate as if we are just investing into the uh, into some uh, interest rate uh, so you can see we have uh, 53 columns which you have means you have 52 asset and one so to say not risky asset right and we're going to use in this tutorial two libraries first one is called the uh, pi portfolio opt uh, basically it come it encapsulates a lot of methods uh, we discussed today and it allows in the in the very easy way to implement new routines for optimization new loss functions to combine them so i think it's a good tool for the practitioners and second is uh, i think i just celebrated mlkin lab uh, it's basically the guys who are the 
it's the Hudson Thames Research Lab. Basically, they are implementing many interesting uh, financial, not just machine learning, but also financial modeling features. And uh, for example, we're going to use their backtest statistics and a couple of machine learning based algorithms for portfolio optimization. All right, so this is the data. And uh, yes, we talk what we want to extract from it. We want to extract from it expected returns and the uh, covariance matrix. I also want to show you just in case you don't know what is covariance matrix because there are questions what is risk, what is risk, uh, why variance, blah, blah, blah. Because basically, what is covariance matrix is describes, as you can see, uh, for example, on the main diagonal, you can have like basically variance asset by asset. And covariance is basically how two assets covariate together. So basically, if you consider that the normal variance of one single asset is the, like the volatility, it's the proxy of the volatility. The risk. The more volatile, the more variant is the asset, uh, the more risky it is. And also, I want the covariance because obviously these assets are correlated at up to some point with each other. So this is our risk model. Uh, risk model is uh, the the variance and covariance. Uh, so also one important thing we're going to do is still going to have some sort of like train and test set here. Basically, we are going to use the data from 2007 to 2012 to fit our covariance matrix and the estimated uh, expected returns. So basically, we're still going to do as a machine learning to fit the models. And in our case, just the models are very simple. We fit the models on the data till 2012. And the last uh, four, four years, four and a half years, we are going to test the performance of the portfolio. So what we're going to do, we are going to feed covariance matrix and expect, expected returns on this on first part of data, optimize it and get some set of weights. Then we're going to apply these weights to the rest of the data and see what would happen if we invested for two and a half years for this uh, with this allocation. And let's start with the very simplest possible way to allocate money as we discuss is the equal allocation. Basically, one divided by 53 for each of the assets. And basically, here we calculate the list of the weights uh, to multiply, basically, we calculate the returns, percentage returns from the data frame multiplied by the weights. And Basically, that's what we can see. I put here cumulative sum because obviously first it returns just the returns of the portfolio and also I remove the non-value because when you look at the difference, the first value disappears. So if you want to see the returns, for example, basically that's how they look like. This is the returns, daily returns. And this is basically how the returns are compounding in the portfolio. Right now, let's do the maximal sharp optimization. Uh, so first, as we discussed, we need to estimate the parameters, the models, and as you can see here, we calculate the mu, which basically the mu from the slides. It's uh, exactly this one, where the mu from the slides are the expected returns, and uh, sigma big S is the sample covariance matrix, which is our risk model. Uh, the covariance matrix looks like this. So you can see that there are some assets that are highly, basically you see the range comes from more than 30 to minus 20. So some assets are correlated, some assets are decorrelated. So we can have some image of what's happening in here. Then we build this efficient frontier as we discussed here. We define the efficient frontier based on the risk here, ah, sorry, you didn't see my slides. Let me, let me do it like this. So basically, you see the risk here and expected returns here. So we build this efficient frontier. We maximize the sharp. As you can see here, optimization is already encapsulated. We also can clean the weights to reject some so that's very close to zero and print the performance. So you can see it's, it's done really quickly. It shows the expected new returns, new volatility, sharp ratio, which is on the train data. So this is the overfit data. But this is the overfit, which means that we kind of fit the model and we're going to apply it to the future data. As I can see what the weights are. 
And basically, the, the situation we guys discussed a bit a couple of, couple of minutes ago, that uh, when you maximize for the shark, you can help, you can help uh, have highly not balanced portfolio. Basically, you see that all that you have is concentrated on the six asset. But that's what we have, that's what we can have when we maximize just for the sharp. Uh, basically, we, again, we now we calculate the performance on the test data and print uh, the um, equal allocation on the test data. We calculated it here, it's on the test data frame. And uh, basically our max, uh, maximum sharp ratio portfolio. You can see that it uh, at least visually looks like it even ended performing worse, even was like more growing, the drawdown were less. But uh, we will measure the exact statistics of the portfolio a bit later. Now we're just playing with the library and kind of checking what's going on. We also can calculate minimal variance portfolio. Basically, we still use the same models for returns and the risk. But here we say minimal volatility. And if you visualize it, basically it says this invest just in the US dollar, which actually makes some sense because basically if you invest just in the interest rate over cash, it uh, kind of makes some sense. Yeah, that's the, maybe the least volatile thing ever. Also, you see it gives a super small piece of the portfolio here, but basically it's kind of almost neglect neglectable. 99, more than 99% of the assets we have to invest in the interest rate to be as least volatile as possible. Again, this is not a diversified portfolio at all, as you can see, but from the point of view of optimization, that's completely right, because our portfolio is like this year, grew by like, by how many percent? By 1%, basically, as, as we discussed, you said the interest rate of 1%, uh, but, but this is what we have. Well, let's also play a bit with the metrics. Because uh, let's see, let's calculate actual sharp ratios on the test sets, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, this is ML FinLab. This is the library that uh, I recommend you guys to use for many advanced things apart from portfolio optimization. And uh, so we can see the sharp ratio is asking us for the time series of the returns and the number called entries per year because we want to calculate annualized uh, sharp ratio. Uh, so this way, for example, if we had uh, not daily returns by week, but weekly or monthly returns, we have to multiply by square root of basically how many entries per year we have. And uh, for example, for Max uh, Sharp portfolio, this is the one we had, uh, the first one, this blue one. The sharp pressure is 0 0.31. And for the equal allocation, 0 0.41. So we can see that actually, uh, it's even, uh, it will even perform better out of sample if we keep allocating equally, right? So this is like also the interesting trick. Here I show you the example that we do everything, not fully correct, but at least realistically. So for example, imagine we are like in the end of 2012, you take the past data, estimate all these weights, and then kind of invest. And we can see that even if we optimize for maximal sharp ratio in the past, on the past data, it doesn't mean that it will be maximal sharp in the future. So you can see in the future, even such a simple baseline can perform much better. And that's basically what, we, what you guys talked about, the uh, overfitting, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's what happens. And uh, to try to foresee such situations, try to predict it something, I showed you one slide when you saw some methods how to deal with this. Let's calculate probabilistic sharp ratio. In this library, it returns the probability that uh, this sharp ratio we got is uh, higher than the baseline. So we want to see, okay, obviously it's not, but let's calculate what the, the tells us. Obviously it says that this value, this sharp ratio is higher than this one is super extremely slow probability. So it seems like it's not overfit, it's the right number. We also can calculate the deflated sharp ratio. So for example, if we can say that uh, we had some experiments and uh, okay, we have here max sharp ratio 0 0.3, but just imagine we also played with some hyperparameters and we got uh, such results. 
it still has really it has very high very high probability that uh, the result is not overfit basically this is the probability of the of this sharp ratio being true if our previous experiments were like this but just imagine if one of the experiments was like this as you can see such a probability it falls dramatically because now uh, we can't say nothing we can't be confident about our portfolio but if you put for example you can see it's already a bit more adequate also we can calculate information ratio so basically it takes as input uh, the the returns of the our maximal sharp portfolio and as a benchmark you take uh, average mean uh, return of the equal allocation test and uh, it says that we have negative information actually it's kind of true because we perform worse and for example uh, it's not we don't really outperform it in any way basically so we have actually negative information also we can calculate minimal track record so for this maximum sharp strategy to outperform baseline we actually need to run it for uh, around a year 250 days and it also kind of makes some sense uh, sorry not to outperform but to see that these results are because they're consistent and if you calculate the drawdown and time underwater so basically the highest percentile that we can go down is uh, around 58 percent that's basically the super huge drawdown and uh, almost more than one year under the water somewhere mm. should calculate maybe it was this year most probably the longest year under the water since that was this one yeah so this is how we can judge our strategy, not just from a single sharp pressure, but comparing to the baseline, calculation probability of overfitting, calculating how much information we got over the baseline and uh, how much we should uh, measure the strategy, how, how much we should uh, kind of record it, track it to see if it's still adequate. And also time drawdown, time underwater is also a very logical thing to track. Um, you see there's also one important moment that uh, when we talk about the portfolio management we always uh, have some benchmark basically the benchmark can be the market itself for example if you want to beat s p 500 the stocks the, the top american stocks and uh, basically you have the s p 500 from the yahoo finance as your benchmark and you are trying to for example take the same stocks but that changed the weight differently because S&P 500, if I'm not wrong, it's cap weighted, capitalization weighted index, capitalization weighted portfolio. But uh, maybe you can do it smarter. Maybe you can create better weights or better policy to work with this weight. So uh, you always want to compare with the benchmark and you want to compare the probability of overfit. You want to compare information gain. You want to compare drawdowns, track record lengths, etc., cetera, et cetera let's try to fix maximal sharp strategy so basically uh, we know that uh, here we have several problems and problem number one it uh, has lower sharp ratio so it's kind of like we on historical data wanted to maximize sharp but in the future it doesn't work well so it's a clear sign of the overfit when the strategy optimized in the past for maximizing sharp performs performs worse than the benchmark that's already completely wrong second problem we got here it's not diversified at all so let's try to fix it somehow and uh, uh, all right there seems like i need to show you more slides because uh, I, I jumped a bit too fast into the practice uh, yeah let me show a couple of bit more slides so basically but it's it's actually in time uh, i mentioned overfitting uh, when we fits a model even the model is super stupid just taking the mean or taking the covariant matrix is still a model from the data and then we take it in the past it underperforms in the future so how to fix this we have curse of dimensionality and overfitting and first is curse of dimensionality so basically this huge covariance matrix it's basically a complete graph because we measure interaction of each item with all other items so basically the dimensionality is very huge it's higher than it should be and uh, the problem is that uh, 
it's kind of it's kind of fun that it has high dimensionality but then it means that uh, it will be easier to it to overfit and when you have high dimensional data for example like you know in deep learning why deep learning uh, needs a lot of data because it has a lot of parameters and statistical learning theory tells us that to fit the model with huge amount of parameters we need much more huge amount of data so when it has such a complete graph we need to have also much more returns much more data but we are kind of limited in the years so what we can do we can increase sample period of frequency so for example instead of taking daily returns we can have minutely returns and in this way maybe estimate of the model will be better because a lot of parameters a lot of data it's kind of like a fit we can then decrease number of parameters we can kind of find a tricky way to have not a complete graph but something like a half graph or even much less parameter or we can impose the structure but imposing the structure as we can see for example having the tree instead of a matrix uh, basically it also what it does it imposes the structure and decreases number of parameters and uh, basically yeah the, the problem of the same discovery matrix as with the markovitz here etc the problem is that uh, the small deviations in the forecasted returns will cause to very different portfolios and you will see this so basically this uh, portfolio is based on the optimization not stable at all also this covariance matrix to be kind of inverted while we do the quadratic programming so it also gives us some let's say limits from the we can't have any possible matrix here uh, basically also there is such a thing called markovitz curse because the more we discuss it that you want decorrelated assets then uh, uh, basically the more decorrelated assets the lower we get the volatility of the portfolio but uh, it can give also unstable results uh, and uh, the correlation is changing all the time so basically kind of are tending to overfit and that's with what we saw we simply overfit to the past uh, and there can be for example when how to reduce the dimensionality the most simple and stupid way possible what you can imagine is to have a constant correlation model. So, okay, in the covariant matrix, there is the element rho, which basically measures the correlation between uh, asset uh, i and j. You can say, okay, they, it's, they have all the same correlation. It's uh, very stupid. So basically, we reduce the number of parameters drastically, but we have a model specification risk. So basically, same, similar, the same correlation, it's like definitely not the, not, it's not correct, but this is what, uh, research is tried to do first and actually it could show some results at some circumstances but this is not really a realistic assumption another idea is uh, some sort of regularization uh, also it's called like uh, shrinking the model so when we sample this covariance matrix it suffers from overfitting because it's just fit on the trained data and curse of dimensionality and uh, when we want to impose some kind of model uh, it's really easy to misspecify it. So basically, it's kind of cool to have a constant correlation, right? But uh, it's simply not correct. It's misspecified model. So you want to have some sort of like trade-off between the sample views and the model views. For example, sample views is basically the sample covariant versus the historical data. But then you can also add some model views. But for example, the model views from the like constant correlation uh, forecasted uh, from the neural network covariances etc 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 it doesn't really matter but again as you can see you kind of build some sort of weighted average of these two matrices of these two covariance matrices but one is from the sample data and second is from some model that ideally has less parameters and this way you have more robust risk estimation because you're not fully overfit to the data you also impose some model views even the model is so stupid that it's like constant correlation and uh, this is exactly what i'm going to do right now as you can see we can add the we can change two things first of all mu we can put here expected returns capa model capital asset price model so if we still didn't forget it this is really a stupid model it's not really it just says that uh, my asset return is kind of linearly dependent from the market return right it's super stupid but let's it's better than just overfitting to the past and second we can uh, apply this shrinkage one of the algorithms for the shrinkage to the covariance matrix and let's see what it changes basically we did two things now and uh, i can tell you even more let's do it one by one 
I think it will be kind of cooler to make it one by one because I wanted to add also third thing here. Let's just start with the with the change in the capital is changing the expected results to the capital asset model. So basically, we change this. Here we have we have nothing. So basically, we just change this line. And what happened, guys? As you can see, already it started to be more diversified. Uh, and it performs close to the benchmark. And let's also calculate the metric because this kind of, if you check it visually, it can anyway tells us nothing. Let literally compare the numbers. So we remember that the normal sharp pressure optimization gave us 0. Uh, uh, 30. MSR fixed gave us actually almost the same as the almost the same sharp ratio as the benchmark. We actually can see it in the numbers. And we can be 99% confident that it's actually better than our red line, which is kind of stupid max sharp ratio and has 10% more of information gain. But it's still worse if you compare it to the equal allocation benchmark. Because if you set up benchmark is equal location, they have almost the same sharp ratio, but it's not really better. So you can just can it's just fifty percent guess that it's better, and actually it has less information. Let's keep, but we already see that just in fixing and making better a single model for the returns, already got better results. Let's now fix covariance matrix and shrink it with some model views, basically model views of the constant correlation. Wow, guys, it's already much, much better diversified. And if we check the performance, I think it will be even perform better than the both than the red line than the benchmark. But let's check the numbers. Actually, uh, as we can see, that uh, yeah, it performs uh, better, obviously, still better than the stupid sharp ratio and has very really big information gain. F compared to the gray equal location benchmark, it's not really better. Actually, from the sharp point of view, it's a bit worse, but it does have information gain. And actually, it's really logical because we made our model smarter, so we got the information gain. That's very nice. We also want to have, and we can have another thing. Uh, we can also add a regularization. So basically, even here, the weights are kind of more or less diversified, but still there are some assets that uh, are smaller, higher. Let's impose also L2 regularization that will also make our locations even more smooth. And let's see what, we, what it will give to us. Uh, Sorry, more smooth from the point of view, what does alter regulation? It removes in the past data something what is close to zero, right? So what is alter regularization? It smooths to the zero or to some very small uh, values on the past data set. So actually our results in portfolio is not that well diversified because we smoothed it on the past data, right? But if we check the sharp ratios, we could finally beat the benchmark, equal allocation benchmark. Okay, this probability is 61%, which is better than 50, with a really good uh, information gain and much, much, much better than the stupid sharp ratio. So as you can see, that's what basically what we did now, you can easily relate it to the normal regularization in machine learning. What you did before, you just overfit it to the past data, you overfit the returns, you overfit the risk, you didn't impose any regularization, and you got what you got. And after you add that basically two better models and regularization, you started to perform better. Basically, guys, the same as normal machine learning. Let's also try to implement custom objectives. 
for example, we can discuss about uh, decorrelation. Let's try to do this. Well, let's try to build a decorrelated portfolio. Now we know that it's kind of better to use regularization, to use KPM return, coherent shrinkage. Let's kind of make, try to make the different portfolio. So basically, this is what our model think is completely decorrelated portfolio. So you can see decorrelation is some sort of like risk diversification. So it doesn't perform really well apart from one jump in the end. But basically, but at least as I said, uh, when you want to decorrelate and diversify, it doesn't mean that you're looking for the good performance. You want for the diversification. Diversification is already another thing. Also, we can add another uh, another idea of the like risk parity we discussed like i want to diversify among the different risk sources and if you launch this portfolio what we can have you see basically red line is a max sharp the stupid one uh, this is our risk parity portfolio and uh, what's interesting if you compare it to the max sharp it has higher sharp ratio so it's not overfit but it has less information gain so basically it's interesting that sharp ratio. As you can see that there is a really conflict between diversification and maximizing for the returns because even the overfit max sharp, which is red, it still has more information, which kind of nicely risk diversified model. But this is the trade-off, guys. The, the only thing we could do, we could kind of try to merge these objectives and uh, try to merge the things. Um, what also we can do? All the portfolio we had here, as you can see, they all have positive weights, which means that we're going all long portfolio. We are not shorting anything. So basically we think that uh, we can just invest. But we also can do the shorting. So also actually we can bet that the stock will go down and we can earn money on the, on the falling of the stock. It doesn't matter what's the mechanism uh, of such a, such a trading, but yeah, basically, uh, on the market, you also can bet on the falling of some stock and you can earn money based on this. Uh, so basically, we still have the same model for returns and for the risk. As you can see here, in the efficient frontier, I'm adding weight bounds. So basically, I want now my weights to be bounded from minus one to one. So I'm allowing negative weights. You do this optimization. It shows us that yeah, it chose two stocks to be shorted. But the problem is that uh, the sum of the absolute values of the stocks is a bit higher than one. This kind of trick how optimization works. Basically, if you put a constant, the sum equals to one. Uh, for example, uh, minus one plus one plus one equals to one. But uh, you can't allocate like 300% uh, of your portfolio, you know. So this is why I divide basically by the some sort of a norm to get normalized values of my weights. And let's check this portfolio now. So basically, again, we compare it with the, but now I compare with the max sharp fixed. So basically by fixed, I mean with the right returns and the right covariance model. The only thing I changed compared to that model is I allowed my maximum short portfolio to short something. And as you can see, uh, from all the metrics, from the sharp ratio, from the deflated sharp ratio probability, and from the information ratio, uh, actually really do much better. So actually shorting, it can be a good thing uh, if you're confident, if you know that you can, uh, can execute this deal. We could outperform our previous portfolio even a bit more. Uh, what, what else we can do with the risks? Uh, someone in the comments said that uh, um, why do we want to penalize and consider risk just the volatility? Because volatility, it means that price can go up very quickly and down very quickly. So this is uh, like uh, um, basically what you really want to do, you want to penalize the model for going up quickly, but if it goes up for going down quickly, but if it goes up quickly, it's kind of good for you, right? Because you're earning. So you can also calculate as a risk matrix semi-covariance, just taking the upper, basically the part that is over zero. So, uh, sorry, below zero. So basically you're gonna penalize just for the, uh, for the 
covariance that leads to the drawdowns. And you see, basically, I calculate, take some time to recalculate it. Then I take this as a risk matrix. Everything else stays the same, max sharp. Uh, as you can see, the portfolio didn't change that much. Basically, we got just a small gain of a sharp ratio, which is, uh, I would say, significant, and just a small, small, small gain of the, of the information. But still, you can see that uh, it's super small change, but it actually indeed gave something. So uh, it made sense in this experiment. Let's discuss it for a while. Uh, where can one get data? Basically, this is a very good question to Google in for. I can do it for you. And so you can see there is like financial statements data sets. There is site that sells you data. There is also financial data on Yahoo, Yahoo Finance where you can download it in CSV. You see, just press the button, so it should be button download. Is there was somewhere button download. Ah, here, button download and you download it. Also, there is data on Kaggle, so basically there is a lot of sources where you can get historical data. What does time under water mean? As we saw, in some point, strategy can go under water, which means, for example, here at this point, we are relatively on the peak. And after this time, we started to go down, 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 down all the time. And the next moment where we came back to the point where we started, is where the, this time underwater finished. We came back to the surface of the water. And time underwater, basically this, this length in terms in measured in years. Uh, from the plot with the sharp maximization at the baseline, the most closest period, the sharp had the better performance. It's correct, to, it's correct to say that it could be a good estimate only for the closest period. So after several months, you recalculate your base, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, yes, uh, what you want to do, you want to uh, recalculate your weights regularly, but still, basically this is like um, classical overfitting. It's like, uh, uh, yeah, in the next, if you estimate some parameters based on the data you see now, yeah, I think you can expect that the next month it will be more or less the same. It's like more or less adequate guess. But if you want to use the same data to forecast them in a year or two, obviously you need to or wait for new information or to have much better model that's regularized better. So basically it's like, uh, yeah, in a way you're right, but still it's always better to have a better model. Could you please give an example of how decorrelation works? Uh, basically, what it does, what it does, what it does. Uh, so you see, it minimizes the value of the squared weights multiplied the correlation matrix. So basically, the lower you'll get the correlation. So basically, it will allocate to such pair of assets that have low mutualized correlation. So basically you have your correlation matrix and uh, it will seek for such values of the weights that will put the weights to the assets that have really low correlation, just simply that. And that's what we saw happening in one of, I think it was this one, the correlation, yeah. I think this jump is, must, there must be some error in the data. I don't think that there was actually some Jump. I think it's the error of the data, but basically you can see the performance. This is like decorrel. That's how decorrelated assets. You see, it's not looking for any performance because it just it just put money in something what is like completely uncorrelated. That's it. Let me more questions, guys, because this is like uh, I think not super easy topic, right? 
or everything is easy for you. Okay, I'll upvote the, this question so don't forget about answer about it in the end. Yeah, also for the practice part, obviously, guys, you're gonna have this notebooks. So basically, you play with all the code. I think I'll just upload it to the GitHub and send the link to the chat. And also, I mean, a bit later, so you're going to have a bit more algorithms today. Uh, but yeah, basically, that's that's what what we do. I think what's important here that we see that. Uh, Basically, the whole idea is like what is overfitting. Overfitting that uh, is really well seen in this example. It's like I want to maximize sharp ratio, and uh, it's known that it's known that if I take the train data, I maximize the sharp, I can get the maximal sharp, and I could get on the train data. But when I try to use the same weights in the future, we can see it fails really bad. So it's a problem. But since but right after we change a bit the model, so we make specification of the model and uh, um, regularization of the model better it starts outperform this baseline so basically uh, that's for example why i really like machine uh, financial machine learning because when we study the things like deep learning when we study uh, birds and op etc etc we really kind of miss the idea that we need to perform well in the future in the unseen examples and uh, uh, because in nlp and images we this kind of concept of the future is really is really skipped because we don't actually have the future. We have some set of the images on set of the data that are just kind of neural networks didn't train on, so we kind of check their the accuracy. But uh, what we actually really what's the whole idea of the machine learning and finance? It's seen like directly. We have to predict and or predict or perform in the future. Good good with respect to symmetric and even in this example as you can see we didn't do any learning it's like we didn't train any algorithm but you can see how model specification impacts the performance and this is like what we can see uh, in if i choose like deep neural network or shallow neural network what happens we see how regularization impacts if i add drop out or don't end drop out and here we can see that even without learning itself we still can see this concept and we can see them in practice. That's why I really like this field because it allows, it gives you um, kind of, from my point of view, much more profound understanding of all the other concepts. And then uh, when you go out and do, let's say, computer vision, and when you treat computer vision as it is like performance in the future, you're really much more careful. And you think, when you think in the terms of model misspecification, uh, and uh, stuff like this, you already don't think in terms of, oh, I need to change real layer to cellular layer, or I need to add more layers, or I need to make higher dropout, or something like this, you know. So that's why I think this field is also very good from the educational point of view, because it teaches you the concepts that are, you are, anyway, you're meeting anywhere in LLP vision, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what is the most efficient metric for the goal of maximizing returns? This is the, you just optimize for the returns. <laughs> but, uh, okay, let's, let's try, let's check this library. Let's try to optimize for the returns. I think there was a, there should be a metric. So, efficient function optimization. I think they have the, like you can try to optimize uh, directed the return i think it is here efficient uh, return not sharp efficient risk okay it can give you efficient return so okay let's try let's try somewhere somewhere here I'm going to just copy pieces of code because we basically are copying here things. Uh -huh. 
uh, let's, but here is, uh, okay. how do they call it? Should return. I think you need to put here, for example, I want to make 10%. I think it works like this, this supposedly. Target return has to be lower than the largest. Ah, actually, target return must be lower than the largest expected return. So you see, the guys are also smart. Basically, you can't optimize for the kind of database that you have to optimize to have return higher than you have in this database. So it's it completely makes sense. Okay, let's optimize for the maximal one. What is the maximal one? Okay, let's just also check it. Almost seven percent. Okay, let's optimize for this one. No problem. And uh, let's also now draw the things. What it selected? We see it select. We see it selected just one asset that was performing the, the most. But also, let's check the portfolio. Let's call it uh, max return. And uh, yeah. return. So basically, you see it was obviously clear overfit. So you overfit for something in the past and that's what you got in the future. It's like, uh, uh, it's clear what happened, I hope. Uh, not easy, definitely. We will need to do it by own after election to understand. Yeah, yeah, guys. Uh, could you explain how you implement the strategy in real life? I mean, you create such a strategy by stocks and weight. Do you measure performance of strategy in time? If yes, how? Uh, how can you see if, if the strategy doesn't work properly in real life? That's guys, uh, basically in a very, very stupid, naive way. Yes, I take the past data, for example, take 10, 20 years of the stocks I selected before based on my own beliefs and the reasons. Then I select the factors for the stocks. For example, because as you can see here, I use K uh, capital asset pricing model for the to forecast the returns. So basically I can also make other factors and uh, make my returns. Then basically, yes, I optimize it. I get the weights and I invest based on this phase and yeah, I sort of wait. And then why I showed you guys these variables because all these variables I can actually track in real time based on some sliding window. And I can see that, uh, for example, my sharp, my rolling sharp is getting is still higher than the rolling sharp of the benchmark. It means, yes, I'm outperforming. My rolling information ratio is higher than the benchmark. It means, yes, I'm uh, outperforming. My probability is also pretty high, et cetera, et cetera. My factor exposure is the one I wanted to. So basically, yes, in the most simple way, it says when I see something goes wrong, maybe I do rebalancing. But in reality, you kind of automate this process and you do actually rebalancing, for example, every month. Every month, the new information appeared, you refit your models for returns, you re refit your risk models, and you keep going. Have you ever used Bayesian models? Why, why not? Uh, I use them, but not in finance. Uh, I think uh, I should use them more, just uh, kind of like uh, I never really had time for a profound research to uh, prove myself that, uh, okay, for example, I have the not Bayesian model for predicting returns and Bayesian model and uh, like I had like deep evidence that it performs better I just never actually even had time to do it. I think uh, in my opinion I think but of course Bayesian modeling is uh, much more robust it's uh, better actually today we will see one Bayesian model but it's not really Bayesian model but it has like Bayesian mindset. I like Bayesian models, but I never really bet on them, for example. All right, let's also check a bit more what's uh, what with another models for allocating the money. Uh, 
All right, the next, uh, we discussed the risk parity model. Basically, we discussed it, I think, uh, somewhere here, that uh, we want to allocate, uh, spread the risk in the different baskets. For example, I want to have the baskets of equal risk, equal volatility, or something like this. The problem is that, uh, again, this is like I am doing it in terms of the whole covariance matrix. Uh, so this is, uh, I might suffer from curse of dimensionality. But what if I could reduce the dimensionality by imposing the structure? So basically I do not such a linear diversification. But for example, first I split all my stocks into two groups. And for example, I want to do equal allocation, like one divided by one. But I do it in a bit more interesting way. First, I divide the two groups based, for example, on the two clusters based on their similarity, like I do like normal clustering. I found two clusters that one cluster is similar, second cluster, they're similar to each other. I put 50-50 there. That's what you see by examples. Then inside of the each clusters, I go and again the 50-50, 50-50, unless I define some rule or to stop or define some metric to stop. The same I can do, not like, for example, based on the similarity. I can by, do it based on the risk. I can uh, define clusters by the risk and define equally in the risk. And basically in this portfolio, uh, I impose a structure where on each step optimization, I have much lower dimensionality. Basically I have dimensionality of the number of clusters instead of dimensionality of the number of all the assets. And the procedure, again, I'll give you materials how to read it and you'll have all the time to read about it. Basically, the idea is kind of simple. First, I perform three based hierarchical clusters of the covariance matrix. And this way, you can actually get the clusters of the, of the different companies. For example, in, in this illustration, you can see that, uh, okay, it, it uh, get that uh, banks and telecom company into one cluster. Johnson & Johnson is kind of by itself. Facebook, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft in one cluster. Apple, Alibaba, and no, Apple also kind of like, in a way, several separate cluster. Alibaba and Tencent together, which makes sense. And Samsung Electronics, another cluster by itself because it can. It makes sense. Then we regroup the covariant matrix based on the groups. And then we basically do this hierarchical optimization. Uh, we still use the covariance matrices, but each of the covariance matrices already has lower degree. It's already smaller, so the dimensionality is smaller. And first, for example, on this image, uh, basically second image, the right part, we have uh, five clusters. And first we allocate over five clusters based on the risks and it's five dimensions. Then inside of each cluster, we have also like one, two, three, four, five dimensions. So we do kind of like divide and conquer hierarchy, which is, and then we, that's what means recursively allocating based, for example, or we just do equal, or for example, we do as we saw like, uh, calculate risk inside each cluster and kind of spread, spread the risk equally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, the idea is, uh, uh, I wouldn't say straightforward, but it's very interesting. Another two ideas uh, to how to impose the structure in the model, because we saw that we can reduce the dimensionality of the model. We can actually regularize the model with something. Uh, we can again impose structure in the model. Another kind of structure can be imposed with the idea that your covariance matrix or for example, even all the movements of your assets, uh, they can be, they basically have also some not explainable factors in a way, right? So basically what does PCA, when you have a data set of, uh, and you apply PCA to it, it, uh, gives the principal components. Basically, these principal components, they're like, they optimize to explain the most variability uh, in, the, in the data. For example, uh, yeah, basically, if you apply PCA, for example, to the faces, your first uh, component, it kind of like smooths the face, just leaves the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, because that's the principal components of the face. Second component is when you connect first and second and first component, as you get more details in the face. And this way you kind of build a composition of the components where they all together, they give you the complete data set, but the first component explains, uh, uh, let's say 80%, 
of the variability of the second model 10%, third model 5, fourth 3%, etc., 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 etc. Uh, the also interesting point that these components are orthogonal. So also you build the orthogonal represent the representation of the data. So basically, if the first component it indeed explains 80% of the data and kind of smooths the data, the second component should be orthogonal. So it explains completely other factors in the data. The third model completes also orthogonal to the previous two. So this way it's like uh, first of all you get some factors, and second they're orthogonal, which is also good. And if you apply this idea to the market, if your portfolio is a linear combination of the assets, right? And uh, why, for example, we calculate this capital waste, capital, capitalization based weights, equal weights, or minimal variance portfolios? Why actually we do that? Because this is our, our benchmarks. Basically, we have a lot of assets and we need to create like the, and these assets, they can represent the market. And uh, it's still kind of not clear what to define by the market. For example, if you talk about the S&P 500, they consider like the market is capitalization weighted portfolio. This is what they say, that's the market moves. But they also can be equal allocation or even minimal variance can be the market proxy. And uh, for example, if you build the first principal component that explains most of the variability in the market, you can say that this is the proxy to the market, the principal component. This is something that explains the behavior of the market, right? That's kind of a cool idea. And then we can have second component that explains the rest, but another. And if you have this principal components, it can give us actually really interesting insights in terms of like what our market is built of. Because this is the pieces of our market from the PCA point of view. Uh, Another thing, this is like the PCA, that's what it does. It's kind of like explains the variation in the data. But also, for those of you who studied a bit about auto encoders, basically know that auto, okay, one, one more thing about PCA. And we also know that, for example, from PCA, we can reconstruct the data, right? So basically, if you kind of get this principal component, for example, you take away, for example, you Take just one component from this component, you can reconstruct the original image, but without some details. As you can say, like first principal component of the face is just like some wag eyes, nose, and mouth, because that's what the principal in all the faces you have in the data set. Uh, so yeah. Another thing that also can do the same, some sort of reconstruction of the data are autoencoders. Basically, this is the neural networks that are trained to reconstruct itself. So basically the idea is the same. You define some sort of neural principal components. First, you take your input data, uh, squeeze it to the sprint to the dimension of the principal components. I mean, so to say principal components. And then from them, you try to reconstruct the input and uh, you expect that uh, you will be able to reconstruct it really well. And if you reconstruct very well, that means that inside these principal components, they really capture a lot of variation about the data. And uh, what is the cool idea about auto encoders? They can be nonlinear, they can be deep, they can be like with the reluce, et cetera, et cetera, everything what, what you like. And uh, it's proven also that basically auto encoders, they are able to capture extremely comp complicated patterns. For example, birds in NLP, they're by the nature of the auto encoders. Uh, a lot of computer vision models are also based on the auto encoders. Guns, generative adversarial networks, they have really close connection to autoencoder generative models. So basically, um, let's us also to apply this idea to our data and let's see how PCA and autoencoders, how they can or if they can uh, reconstruct something, right? Uh, so yeah, let's do the horse racing, but now with the some neural algorithms. Uh, let, me, let me scroll here. Basically, now I'm going to use a bit more the ML FinLab library. And uh, as you can see, basically, when they do the clustering, they allow you to do, for example, equal weighting. You just, you know, all clusters are cited equally. Or you can use the start deviation as a set of risk, and you can uh, split the risk across the uh, uh, clusters. And also, guys, you asked me what can be another risk measures expected shortfall, uh, conditional drawdown risk. 
this is something what uh, we didn't cover today, but there are like also financial, a bit, I would say, econometrical measures of the risk apart from the variant of storage deviation. So let's calculate again. These are good models, covariance, mu. And you see that what we do, that we define the model, we give the assets, we give the covariance matrix, and we calculate the weights. And also we will plot the class. It will take for a while because it does the clustering and kind of like does like hierarchical clustering. So it's not extremely fast, but it's also not very slow. What we can see here, but indeed it found some interesting structure in our market, which is interesting. At least, okay, there is a one big, huge cluster, but other ones are also interesting. Now we can use these plates. They are already normalized. And let's visualize this portfolio. As we can see, this portfolio performs even worse than equal location. And this is, again, I want to tell you that this is completely normal. So basically, everything that we are doing right now, guys, to be honest, we are just looking for the proxy to the market. Uh, both like equal allocation, capital waste based allocation, even in a way maximal sharp. Because why I'm saying that even maximal sharp is the still proxy to the market? Because maximal sharp is coming from the times of the Markowitz, if I'm wrong, it's not from the 50s, 1954, I guess, where investors believe that everyone on the market is maximizing their sharp ratio. So it's like, what is the proxy to the market? What is the optimal? Uh, and we believe that everyone on the market is optimal, so everyone is maximizing the risk adjusted return. So we, what is the proxy to the market? Maximum sharp portfolio, uh, which is not necessarily true, as we see, because some people look for their diversification, some people look for other things. So basically, uh, I'm also it's like a small spoiler for the future, but all of the messages we're discussing here right now, they're just, they all actually the baselines, because our real goal to build a strong baseline as we discussed in the beginning, to save for the retirement and then over this baseline, as we will see tomorrow, we're going to train neural networks, predictions, alternative data, Bayesian models, blah, 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 to predict something, to get the edge over the market. That's what we want to do. But we are going to want to do it smartly. We first we want to invest in the proxy of the market, for example, half of our capital and spread it, and then use half of our capital for the speculations and the gains. That's how it works. Uh, now let's try PCA portfolio. Uh, again, we believe that it will give us the proxy of the market. So I select 10 uh, components. I train it on the covariance matrix. We can see that first two port portfolios already, okay, three. They already explain everything about the market. And if we draw them, let me just write this. We will start drawing them. As you can see, also what is very, very, very interesting. You remember our decorrelation portfolio, how it behaved. Apart from this unexpected jump, it behaved like this. You remember our minimal variance portfolio, it behaved like this. And they all bet a lot on the US dollar. US dollar here, it means the investing in the interest rate. We just give cash and for the interest. Uh, and PCA as the first component, it says that actually US dollar with some minor contributions is the proxy to the market, which is very, very interesting. So basically PCA found if you took analogy from the face, for example, PCA on the faces, that I'll just show you. So the, I'm so I'm not. So PCA on the faces, you see what it does, right? It kind of decomposes. It finds like the eyes, nose, and the mouth because eyes, nose, and the mouth is present kind of on every face, right? So here it founds this US dollar and a couple of other long short portfolios that also have to be kind of present in every portfolio. That's the strongest component. And 
from this point of view, this is the proxy to the market. And completely orthogonal portfolio to the proxy, they found this in guys, and this is completely right. If this is the proxy to the market, we might not agree because, wow, why do we call it proxy? Because it looks nothing like equal allocation. But this is like completely anti-equal allocation. So this is portfolio, this is orthogonal to the first one, and this is indeed orthogonal to the market. So maybe this, this is not completely wrong what it does here. And also there are some other portfolios that are already orthogonal to the previous ones, orthogonal, orthogonal, blah, blah, blah. But this is another very interesting view on the market that sometimes it can give us more stable portfolio than the others. Uh, and now let's try to do something with autoencoder portfolios. Uh, with autoencoder, it will be a bit different logic. With autoencoders, what we'll do, first we'll, with Keras, we'll build the autoencoder with a couple of layers. Basically, it takes a simple, uh, the, again, the covariance. No, it can take even the data, it's the data you see, uh, the prices or covariant matrix. It kind of doesn't matter. We just take the, uh, basically what we fit it on, if we train our data frame and take PCT change, each training sample for the autoencoder will be one day return. So basically it will be trained by daily returns of all the assets and this way it will capture kind of the structure of the, of the daily changes. And since autoencoder is trained to reconstruct the input, later we want to check that what is the principal component. It's the thing that we um, always, uh, something what is, um, Basically, a principal component is a component that explains the most variance. So we want to find the most variant item here. So that's why after we measure the norms between for each of the asset, how good we can predict it. And then we can basically, yeah, this print this as well. We can see that, uh, for example, in our case, the U again, US dollar is kind of the most influent asset here. And then we reweight these numbers. We can get a new portfolio that they say that also US dollar with some minor contributions is the proxy to the market. Which is, again, it's just the point of view of the model. And if we check the two models that are both trained kind of to learn the low dimensional factors, uh, sorry, not low dimensional, but low dimensional statistical factors, they both kind of bet in a way on the US dollar. So basically, this is again, one of the points of view on the market and it's not correct, it's not incorrect, it's just how different models think about the market, not more. And uh, okay, at least for the autoencoder, at least it's the positive sharp ratio which is good, but because PCA, that's why, for example, another evidence of why markets are actually, they are not linear, because we try to learn kind of the same models that try to learn 10 factors, both in terms of PCA, but both in terms of autoencoders, and reconstructed from these factors. But uh, it's kind of clear that autoencoder found better proxy, better from the reconstruction point of view, better from the, with stability point of view, as you can see. Uh, all right, the last thing I want to discuss, to, uh, yeah, I think I'll just finish with the experiments and we'll do a lot of discussions. So basically, why we did all this uh, horse racing, that even sometimes it's even worse than equal locations frequency. So we discussed before that uh, everything starts with the selection of the trading universe, so basically, uh, we as the investors, we want to invest. It's like, for example, I am no, I'm living in America. I live in Silicon Valley, and I understand technology market. I know the factors there in technology market. I select technology market. And then I want to build the proxy of this technology market. Uh, yeah, pro proxy of the portfolio of this technology market. So basically I can do equal allocation, capitalization based allocation, maybe minimal variance, maybe Marcel Sharp, 
basically I build my proxy that uh, I expect will always represent the market. And this is what we do, as you, as you could see, is in a way completely unsupervised. We still have the models, we still want to regularize the models. We still can, for example, regularize the hierarchical tree. We can cut the tree when we want, we can reduce number of the clusters. So we can still have the concept of regularization, of model misspecification, et cetera, et cetera. But then what we do, and that's what we will focus on tomorrow, then we took some percentage of these assets to cover our liabilities, to be secure in this, proxy of the market and with the rest money we try to outperform the market and we use this proxy and for example over this proxy we try to forecast something and this is exactly what we're going to do tomorrow with machine learning and uh, there's okay now let's let's discuss what we did and then we're going to talk about the improvements seems like we're even finishing a bit early but uh, basically, we're going to have a lot of time for discussion, so we can even launch some experiments, etc., etc. Waiting for the questions, guys. Guys. No questions. It's surprising. It seems like everything was super clear. I see only one question in the chat of the Slack. Hi, where can we access the Jupyter notebook? I will upload to the GitHub after the lecture, which will be soon, both with the slides, so you can experiment with it. Uh, could you run some optimizations over different strategies? Could you specify a bit what you mean over different strategies, uh, like uh, different uh, optimization goals or something like this? You want to play with the hyperparameters? Could you specify a bit more? Like you have various strategies and you want to find common objective. Uh, okay, I'll leave it as the upvoted. We can do it in the end because um, we've seen this framework and never did it. So I think I might uh, fail a bit. So it'll be like real time coding, uh, coding in trying. But yeah, yeah, we can try to do it. Let's just leave it till the end, end of the program. I think they have a tutorial how to do it. Should be something like. There should be some guideline how to do it. Yeah, you see, add objective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we can we can do that. I think. But apart from this, no question.
Okay, okay, guys, you can think a bit more about next questions. I'll finalize the program for today. Basically, oh, wait, I need to share the right. The right. Basically, what can be the future improvements of what we did today? Obviously, uh, we as investors, we have different views on the market. We can have a forecast for the future, actually not just from the machine learning models. We can do some our own analytics, we can do even wild guesses, but we need to have a model that is kind of combining this forecasted prices, forecasted returns, and merging them together with the baseline. And one of the most commonly used approaches for this is called Black Litterman portfolios. Basically, this is guys the Bayesian approach that you were asking about. Bayesian approach from the point of view that there is some prior knowledge. Basically, that's why we're talking about the proxy, proxy for the market. There is a prior knowledge about the market, prior returns, prior covariance matrix, prior models. And then you sequentially update these priors with some views, when the views basically are our forecasts, and you get posterior knowledge, this basically kind of merging the views and the baselines. And that's what I wanted, one of the last, latest things I wanted to show you today is the example of such a black Litterman portfolio and how it works. Also, working on the risks, because correlation, as you know, this is the most primitive measure of similarity of the assets, because correlation is just, correlational covariance matrix. It's basically linear similarity between the assets. Uh, but we know that market is actually not linear. All the relationships, they are measured differently. And uh, you might find for a way how to track nonlinear measures, maybe statistical measures, other kind of different uh, distances. Or, and this is kind of one of the latest trends that, that you also asked about is the reinforcement learning. Basically, you want to rethink the whole setup of the problem because in real life, you don't optimize once on the historical data and hold on this space forever. You want to reduce the refresh information. You want to be optimal. You want to be the faster than others. So you need to catch the information sequentially, sequentially update your weights and optimize not for the historical uh, data set, but you want to optimize a policy that updates the weights correctly in real time based on new information from the market. Basically, it's already optimization as an optimal control, not optimization of a single function or reinforcement learning if you want. So this is another thing that's today it's blooming. Basically, these three directions. First one is incorporating the forecasts into these baselines and one of the things you can do is black Litterman portfolios. Second is uh, you kind of still stick with this market zero, with this like uh, idea that you have returns and you have some risk measures, but you change them with nonlinear measures, or you go to the optimal control. And basically, today what we're gonna do, oh, sorry, tomorrow what we're gonna do, we're gonna work on this active investments on this forecasts. Uh, we will discuss basically uh, what is the alpha and how to get it, how to get that overperformance. Uh, we will discuss in depth why machine learning is different in finance compared to the normal one. And as the typical example, I can always tell you the Numerai challenge is the financial forecasting challenge where I am in the top 10% with the linear model. And guys with the boostings and deep learning, there are okay, some of them obviously are, are over me, the ones who are like top five, top nine, etc. But I know that most of the people are just using boosting and uh, uh, portfolio uh, parameter optimization, deep learning, and other cool things that people do in Kaggle, but it doesn't work in finance. So we're gonna check this Kaggle way, and I'll explain you why it's wrong in finance. Then we're gonna fix the data, and we basically are going to fix the model because the model doesn't matter that much. We're gonna fix the data first of all. We will try to predict the assets in the financial way with the machine learning and uh, then it will be a relatively big part on the basically what you need to study what you need to do uh, what are these future parts we're going to talk a bit more about the reinforcement learning about this codependent codependences things 
and a bit about even the theoretical physics. So basically, uh, kind of like the what to do next. One of the questions in the start of the speech was what to do next. Basically, tomorrow in the in the end of the lecture, we're going to discuss what to do next. What they want to do at the moment, I want to answer more questions, and then we'll have, I think, as another small practical session. If you guys ask me for writing some experiments, and we can we can do this. All right, different strategies based on factors, some algobots, various objectives, mean variance, mean correlation. Mm -hmm. I think it's led to the previous question. Uh, factor selection, universe selection, weights optimization. Could you speak more on this? What has most priority? What gives a less additive efficiency? All right, uh, I think it all starts with the universe selection. And basically, very many classical banks, investment funds, or hedge funds, basically all what they do, they just select the universe of the assets. For example, this is what uh, most probably do guys like Warren Buffett. They don't do any factors, they don't do any weights optimization. They just uh, looking for the strong companies based uh, on different, uh, on their beliefs. And uh, they just invest in the strong companies. And this is the, the universe of the strong companies. And uh, basically this is your universe. The next uh, thing is that uh, you don't want basically when you say like good companies, strong companies in your universe, obviously you make the decision based on something. And uh, kind of the next step of evolution for these investors is like, uh, so, okay, I believe this company, for example, is strong because it has good financial reports. It has good revenues. So when you're talking in terms of like the reasons, it's already factors. And uh, when you can talk in the terms of factors that influence your choice, it means you can have a mathematical model for predicting, for example, returns or explaining at least the returns. And uh, this is already like the next level because uh, if you think, wow, this company is big, I like it, but then you can check it numerically and uh, test your DS numerically. So this was like a next step towards the quantitative trading. And then the really next thing is like weight optimization, basically, but that's what we did today. And uh, it, uh, I can't say what gives most priority in some service. It's all important, basically, because if you have a shitty universe, you're not optimized and optimized, it's, it's a crap. You know what I mean? And uh, if you don't understand the factors behind, you will actually will not really be able good in weights optimization because the weights optimization we did today, mm, basically we kind of like diversify the risk. Yes, but it has, it has, uh, it's, it's a baseline, as we discussed. With, when you just gonna diversify the risk or something, it's, it's the baseline. Equal allocation is the baseline. Because without the factors, because without being able to predict something, all what you can do is a baseline and compare it to another baseline, nothing else. So it's all important. I can tell you that uh, something has uh, more or less efficiency. Let's check again popular questions that were here. Uh, why is sharp pressure still used when there is 13 in a ratio which doesn't, which doesn't penalize for positive volatility? Uh, because, as I said, um, not every investor wants to have big jumps either because big jump is also um, unexpected gains are also risky. There might be some reasons for that. What is the potential for reinforcement learning? Uh, basically, it's already used, and tomorrow we're going to talk a bit more on this because today it's. Uh, uh, let's talk about it tomorrow. Uh, how can you find good factors? Basically, you need to be a financial uh, expert to or expert in some area to find the good factors. For example, if you are expert in the artificial intelligence and you want to make a portfolio of the artificial intelligence companies. Uh, you can create the factors, for example, as uh, one of the factors for the growth of the AI companies can be, for example, power of GPUs or something like this, because it is a factor that enables growth of the AI-based companies or the price of the cloud resources or something like this. Uh, uh, books and resources, uh, I'll 
talk about tomorrow. I think one more question. Coming from economics and my background, I like the beginning of your presentation to so compare the econometrics to the new ML ones. Is there a more holistic, deeper comparison with case studies, etc., research paper, books, etc.? Any references are welcome. I can show one thing. Uh, it's uh, relatively empirical, I would say. Just give me a moment, give me a moment, give me a moment. I can't find the should be somewhere. Uh, Should be for free, right? Meanwhile, mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> okay, seems like this question has to be for, for tomorrow. I will I'll add it to my list of the questions for the tomorrow. I need to reg register to answer an end, etc. etc. Just give me a moment, I'll save it as a question. Um, all right, the last question that was, could you please in the end talk more about your job? What is what you do at work? Basically, currently my job, I am chief AI officer at Neurons Lab. Basically, my responsibility is, uh, let's say, working with the solution architects in different uh, industries. Uh, it's like retail, investment management, manufacturing, or different technologies. And basically, we manage the vision for the projects for our clients, vision from the technology and product point of view. And uh, basically, my job is now like, for example, talking about the client investment management. Uh, I'm working with one or two architects in this field, and we can uh, define the vision of the client, we define the risks, we translate his or hers request into a mathematical problem. And then after we design this vision architecture, we give it to the development data science team. So they basically develop the core, then the software development team turns it into, for example, the web app or something like this. And then basically we have a product, for example, for, I don't know, getting the data from the Bloomberg and uh, optimizing for some goals, something like this, and generating some nice reports. Basically, and similar process in, in other fields. So basically, my current job is like uh, being the co-founder of a consulting company, working with the solution architects and visioning projects, and ensuring that they're delivered with the good quality. Something like this. All right, so there was a question about uh, how to combine various strategies and find a common objective. Honestly, I didn't do it within this framework, so it would be, I think, our, some sort of common research right now. Uh, let me share the screen and let's check how they show they can do it in the library because I know that they have a tool to do it. All right, we need to define a new optimizer uh, that can have different constraints, different objectives, must be convex. Okay, sector constraints. Convex, non-convex.
<laughs> All right, what kind of function you want to optimize for? Whatever optimizations we saw, they're basically better for a stable or not to change in market. The models that predict market status for certain situation like COVID pandemic. That's what I showed you in the also very beginning of the presentation that uh, if you want to predict such things like COVID, you don't really predict it. And you need to have uh, good diversified data sources and ability to analyze this data correctly. So if you look only at the prices in the Yahoo Finance or in the Bloomberg, most probably you will not be able. So basically just looking for the market tells you nothing. And that's why we talk a lot about the factors. And that's why tomorrow it will be about forecasting based on the factors because uh, you could foresee some changes in the factors for example in the cooper supply chain that uh, could mean that the basically the big uh, economical activity will be stopped and the same you could see for example with the oil so basically it's not really about the forecasting it's about uh, more like uh, spotting some changes in the underlying factors and it's a bit different it's like because uh, again what we are doing now is just looking at the prices and their covariances that's something that is relatively simple what we that's that's, that's that's what we discussed that's the baseline all that we did today is just the baseline it's the proxy for the market nothing else ah guys what i didn't show you of course i i mentioned in the presentation that there is a black litterman portfolio that allows you to combine like forecasts and your baseline and i didn't show you that black litterman portfolio basically uh, let's consider that we have a baseline represented as the shrinked covariance matrix this is number one and then let's think that we can forecast our prices using exponential moving average so basically we don't take just historical returns we don't take just uh, some dependency of the market if we take like exponential moving average where the last returns are more important than the previous ones and consider this as a better prediction and we take this baseline based on the shrink covariance. We take these predictions as some uh, sort of updated view on the market and get updated returns. Basically updated, it means like uh, we mixed the baseline and the forecast from the model. Then we put these returns to the model, the baseline, and do the optimizations we used to do. And guys, not surprisingly, if you compare this black litman portfolio compare, compared to the previous, uh, the best and the correct Max Sharp portfolio we had before, we outperform it. And we outperform it significantly, both from the Sharp point of view, both from the information ratio gain, gain point of view, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is basically importance of the forecasts in the model so basically if you are able to provide better and better forecasts based on your kind of risk diversifying baseline you can perform very very good and that's why that's why i'm saying all that we did today is just the baselines and the real stuff comes when we do some forecasts uh for example using some bayesian framework we kind of update the we have the pre-war we have the posterior we update it and then we rebalance again and rebalance and now even if you still work in the efficient frontier framework but now our returns are not some past prices it's like our forecasts so we can operate in the world of the forecasts and that's where we can get have actually good results at least better than we used to. Now let's see how we can add the, uh, let's play this multi criteria optimization.
let's for now define some simple mu and s just to be Okay, so we'll consider this is our this, and uh, what you want to do, you want to add more objectives, right? Okay, so <laughs> okay, let's add this one L two norm. Let's try with the tutorial like the teachers. So let's replace L two repolarization with L one repolarization, right? Start with the normal tutorial right. with the CP. Mm -hmm. and let's see what it actually does to our portfolio Oh, very interesting, this portfolio. So you can see adding the L1 norm. So potentially what it does, it uh, basically it's uh, what it does. It uh, makes them closer to zero, the weights, right? Let's see the effect on the weights. Yeah, guys, as you can see, L1 objective, it worked pretty well. Okay, it's not a diversified portfolio, obviously, but we added a new objective and uh, it, it did its impact. Let's add some another objective. Let's, for example, as we discussed before, let's uh, combine sharp for example, with, uh, we have here diversification somewhere. Where it was, where it was. Then conduct objective. I know if it works like this in this framework, to be honest. But let's try. Okay, let's not do this one. Let's just try to see if it works that I want to do risk parity and max sharp, but I don't know if it works to be honest. Well, it seems like it actually even did something, but uh, Hard to tell what it, if it did anything good. <laughs> uh, okay, and if we try decorrelation. But listen, that it does something different, right? Because this was our normal deviation risk parity portfolio. And if we took this one and maximized sharp with it, it gave us something like this, which is already like, okay, it's a new result, yes. Let's try to add decorrelation. Okay. 
something very similar. So you can see this kind of like, if you take uh, decorrelation and try to combine it, uh, any kind of risk. Yeah, basically that's kind of logical. It's uh, tries to diversify the risk, but at the same time, it's trying to maximize it over it. So basically, as you can see, it performs a bit better than the equal location, but, 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 but. so basically it kind of is almost equal allocation, but it tries to maximize the sharp over equal location. So yet, yeah, as you can see, then you can just play with all these things. You can have, seems like very many objectives here. This crazy optimization. And this is our crazy portfolio that is trying to optimize everything simultaneously, which is not that bad. Uh, could you explain once again how Forka specifically work in Black Litterman portfolio? Uh, I haven't prepared slides about it because basically this is a bit uh, out of the scope. Uh, uh, if yeah, I can try to, to put it tomorrow, so let me add it again to the notes. Basically the idea is it's like the Bayesian inference. It's like uh, for example, you are, what is, what is the frequentist versus Bayesian inference? When you're flipping the coin and you want to estimate the probability of the heads uh, in the frequentist framework, uh, you can tell the probability of the coin after, only after you see 100, 1000, 1 million of draws. In the Bayesian framework, you have that there's the prior knowledge. And the, your prior knowledge is that you assume that it's 50-50, right? And then you, when you see 100, 1000 views, observe observations, you can update this 50, 50 a bit to the left or to the right, depending on what you see. Uh, not like in the frequencies approach and just everything from zero. And the black determines kind of the same logic. It's like you have your first, like uh, your baseline, which is your baseline, for example, your portfolio, your starting prior portfolio is for example, just like, uh, I don't know, equal location or some sort of sharp. And then you say, wow, I observe these forecasts. This is my views on the market. And then you're kind of trying to mix them and update your previous allocation to the new one allocation. But uh, I didn't plan to show, to show mathematics. It's like what you can study by yourself or I'll try to squeeze it. Uh, any courses tomorrow, guys. Tomorrow there'll be a lot of materials. Basically, I will go through like more than 10 books and uh, different Coursera courses and not Coursera courses. Uh, uh, I want to finish my two lectures with the complete, uh, basically of what I did. I'll tell you what I was studying, what mistakes I did. I'll tell you even, okay, this is the books I read, but I will tell you what is wrong in these books, actually. So just, we'll just wait a bit. Any more questions? No questions.
Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna wait a bit, like five minutes more, but basically what, everything that I want to show today, I already showed. So uh, from my side, I still owe you the slides and the notebooks from today, so you can have some time playing with it. And obviously you can ask me questions in the Slack. I think uh, tonight I'll be able to answer them. So basically that's it. I'm here, I think I'll be here for five more minutes and uh, I'll be ready to answer the questions. Uh, the access to Jupyter Notebook, I will upload it right after the lecture and I'll upload the link to the chat, to the Slack channel, I mean. Questions, complaints, I don't know. Let me feedback. Maybe you can give me the feedback like uh, this part was good, but this was not clear. Or something like this. It also would be really, I would be thankful for the feedback, obviously. Speaking of real world applications, are there any models, types of models that dominate the market among real investors' funds? Uh, to my knowledge, a uh, different factor based investing is dominating among investor funds now. Basically, they use factor models to calculate the expected returns, and then they use uh, covariance matrices of the factors to basically to estimate the risks. At least to my knowledge, that's like the most common thing. Factor-based investing. Uh, thanks for the lecture. Looking forward. Thank you, Roman. Not for the future. Take a moment to explain on the go any of the economic specific terms. As yeah, you're right. This is where I have to put the like. This is the this is the good one. Uh, tomorrow I'll try to be a bit more, let's say, clear exactly with the economical terms. You're right. Thank you.
All right, guys. I think uh, I hope you don't mind if you finish like ten minutes before than we expected, because basically materials from my side from today are done. Any more questions? Uh, if you have in Slack, please ask me. Uh, with closer to the evening, I'll be able to answer them all. And uh, also, ASAP, I'll upload the slides and the code. Okay, one more question. In theory, some emotional analysis but on Twitter news could be useful as a factor. Is there such thing in practice? Will it be predictive signal? Yes, I confirm. I use it in practice. It uh, has indeed uh, predictive value. The problem is that um, it doesn't have predictive value by itself. So it can be a single factor and it's not very strong. And uh, it's a really regime dependent uh, factor. So basically in some moments it can be useful, in some moments it can be not be useful. It's also another thing why you want to keep retraining. If you're talking about the machine, you want to keep retraining your models over time because uh, in some months, uh, it has predictive value, but in other months, it uh, has no predictive value. So, but it does, it works. It worked for me several times, so yes. All right, guys, please ask me questions in the chat, in the Slack chat, or uh, you can find me in uh, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, just Google my name. I think most probably I'll appear. So thank you for coming. Hope uh, it was not uh, too complicated. Hope it was interesting. And tomorrow, uh, basically, it will be the most interesting part because today we kind of build the baseline. We build the basis. We build the proxy to the market. So we know that after we have some data from Yahoo Finance, we can build this baseline that we can kind of invest in and be more or less confident about, about because we regularize things, we have a good model, shrinkage, some good returns and uh, or adequate estimate for the returns. And this is also what is stable and stable proxy to the market. And tomorrow we will see how to uh, overcome it. Thanks everyone. And Elon Musk's Twitter is the best predictor for Tesla as well as uh, Donald Trump's Twitter is uh, <laughs> at least in this regime, a good predictor for American economy. Thank you, guys. Talk to you tomorrow.